candidates, if you could make your way to the stage, we'll begin in about a minute. Well, good evening and welcome to the 2015 Shakopee School Board Candidates Forum being held at the Shakopee campus of River Valley Church. Tonight's debate is being sponsored by the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau. My name is Rob O'Neill. I'm the pastor of Brookwood Community Church and a member of the chamber and I'll serve as tonight's moderator. Our candidates who are present this evening for school board are Mr. Reggie Bowerman, Mr. John Canney, Ms. Beth Ann Lavoie, Mr. Ken Ludzak, Mr. Matt McKean, Mr. Tony Poss, and Ms. Angela Tucker. Would you give our candidates a warm welcome this evening, please? Candidates this evening are arranged in alphabetical order. They're each going to have an opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement, after which I will ask the candidates questions. Each candidate is going to have one minute to respond, and in some cases their opponents are going to be given 30 seconds to make rebuttal marks. If I choose to ask a follow-up question, candidates will be given 30 seconds to respond to follow-up questions. Each candidate is now going to have the opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement, and we will begin with Mr. Bowerman. Good evening. My thanks to the Chamber for sponsoring tonight, for River Valley for hosting. Our schools are filled with dedicated professionals who are providing an excellent education to our kids every day, and I know that that's true because both of my children are a product of the school district. My daughter is a first-year PhD student in grad school, and my son is a college junior, probably on his way to grad school as well. I want the same positive, successful, well-rounded experience that they had for every student in Shakopee, regardless if they're on a career path or a college path. So I'm running for re-election to the school board because I want to keep the school strong and of the highest quality. And to be very honest, it's to also see through to completion the successful uh, referendum projects that we passed recently that I'm already working on. I've been serving as school board chair or vice chair for the last four years out of a total of six on the board. And I'd like to continue to offer my leadership and my experience to the school board and to the district uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected. I look forward to continuing to serve this district and our schools again if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected. Thank you. Mr. Canny. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the, to the chamber, and also a uh, special welcome to Mr. Thom's class, who is here tonight in strong attendance, and thank you for inviting me this morning to your classroom. As Mr. Bowerman said, uh, I also have, or we also have kids in the district. It's a very exciting time to see where the schools have come over the last few years. And I think it builds into kind of a crescendo in where we're at with the referendum. I have experience in teaching as far as a third grade teacher, fifth grade teacher. I have experience as a principal in leadership, both in Wisconsin. Please don't hold that against me. And then also here at Sweeney Elementary. And then transitioning from my educational career, I moved into owning my own business. And so I look at that experience and I hope that I can bring again to the school board experience in both schools, education, and in business and help us to take the serious decisions that we have now and how we allocate those funds that the public so graciously allow us to spend. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for our kids. I look forward to continuing in the path that the district is headed. Thank you. Ms. Lavoie. 
Hi, thank you again for being here and thank you for watching this debate if you're actually not here. I am a former teacher as well. I taught high school and I have also moved on to teaching at the university level. I teach in Mankato right now. My background is in science education, so I have a love for that. And the reason that I'd really like to run for school board is because I want to make sure that all of our kids stay connected to school, whether they're in the really big high school that has really good plans coming forward to make it feel smaller to them, or whether they're elementary kids who just don't love school so much because they wanna play. We really need to make sure that we're keeping our kids connected. And to do that, we need diverse learning opportunities for all of them. And in addition to that, their whole people Thank and you. their whole brains need to be educated. Yes. So we need to have art and PE and movement and things like that for them. Mr. Ludzak. Hi, my name is, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Ken Ludzak. I'm a 16 year resident of Shakopee. I, I'm married with four children. Three of them are Shakopee High School grads. I've got a sophomore in high school. And I, the first thing I want to say is I'm impressed with the uh, quality and the quantity of the other candidates we have here tonight. Um, I think it's important to uh, serve in the community that you benefit from. Uh, for me, that's meant serving in youth ministry at my church. It's meant serving uh, in youth sports in the community here with the goal of helping young people, including my children, become uh, valuable citizens uh, uh, in the future. Um, I've come to a point in my life where I feel like I need to serve more as, in the community as a whole. And my background is in education. I have a passion for education. My undergrad degree and my original work, f first few years of uh, professional experience were in teaching. And I felt like school board would be a good place for me to offer the, the years of experience I've had in other areas to benefit the community of Shakopee. So I hope I can show you amongst these good people that I'm a good option for a candidate for school board. Mr. McKean. Thank you to our hosts, um, River Valley Church and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and thank you to the rest of these candidates for running. It's great to see such a robust panel of candidates. Uh, my name is Matt McKean. I'm running for re-election. I've served for four years. I got into this four years ago to be part of a dramatic increase in the quality of education in Shakopee. I believe we've made great progress, but there's much to do and, uh, and a lot more as we continue to evolve. As Mr. Bowerman said, um, bringing the referendum to life, seeing the new academies at the high school, engaging in changes at the elementary level and district-wide. I'm, I'm excited to be part of the future. I hope I am uh, re-elected and able to continue serving. Mr. Poss. Thank you. I am here because I want to bring trust back to the school board. I think there was a little, little lost of respect for the school board when the first referendum failed. And as the only member that's been born, raised, and graduated from Shakopee, I think there's traditions that I can hold on to and bring forth through my being part of the school board. Ms. Tucker. Hi, I'm Angela Tucker. I have two kids in the school district. I have a senior at the high school, and we are lucky enough to start our journey again with a three-year-old at Stepping Stones. So we are committed to Shakopee for the next how many ever years it takes him to get there. Um, since we moved to Shakopee, we have been, I have been very engaged in our community. I have served on the CPAC committee, which is a special ed parent advisory council. I have been on the curriculum advisory council. I've been on the facility task force, the strategic task force. I'm very committed and very willing to want to work with our kids and our students. I am one of those who thinks of all kids, uh, especially having a kid with special needs. You really need to be having an, uh, able to have a whole picture. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to the chamber. Thank you for being here and uh, looking forward to a good night. Well, candidates, we begin with a somewhat philosophical question this evening, and that's what is your view of public education's purpose? What is your view of public education's purpose? And Mr. Candy, we'll start this round with you. Just as I'm taking notes. Right. <laughs> well, when you, when you look at the, what we're empowered to do as far as educating, our goal is to help kids to be lifelong learners and productive citizens. So philosophically, uh, that is a big task, and it's something that we're charged with. And I would say along with that is how do we instill 
kids to be lifelong learners and be excited about learning. As we progress with technology um, and with the mandates from the state, it becomes harder to make it exciting to learn and it's a, still though a great responsibility for we as educators in what we can do to help learning be exciting and also how can we gear learning towards individual students as far as how they learn best. Thank you. Ms. Lavoie, what is your view of the public education mission, the purpose of it? It's hard to argue with any other educator about what they think the purpose of education is because we all think it's about real world learning and going on to be a citizen that can be productive and do lots of different things. One thing that would be really important in this era of technology is remembering that kids have access to information 24 seven and so they know information. They just need to learn how to use the information they can find now, and that's really different from giving them information, which is what we did in the past. Mr. Lodzak, the, the purpose of public education. Um, I'll echo what uh, my, the other candidates have said a little bit. I do feel the purpose of public education from an overall standpoint is to generate productive citizens to for the future of our country, for the future of our world. Um, I think the challenge, and this wasn't the question, but the challenge in public education is we do have a diverse a bil a level of students, a diverse background of students, and the challenge for a school board like us or a school district like Shakopee is being able to provide that education that's gonna make them uh, future citizens, productive future citizens to all those diverse students. But the goal is still the same for everyone. Mr. McKeon, the purpose of public education. The purpose of public education is to help every student reach their full potential. That means finding the right way to engage with them, maybe finding a way to have them be interested in coming to school. Uh, I was just fortunate enough to be in Nashville where they're implementing a, a academy, or they've implemented an academies approach, which is all about finding areas of interest so the students wake up and want to come to school. One of the things that um, was an amazing stat, just a fundamental stat in my mind, they started, when they started their process, at 80% average daily attendance. And I said, you know, 80% isn't that bad? Well, that's every kid misses one day a week. How are they supposed to learn if they're not there? So what, what I see is bringing students into the fold, let them have some input in their learning, what's right for them, what helps, them, helps prepare them for a lifelong learning and college and career. Mr. Poss, what is your view of public education's purpose? I think the purpose, we need to give them, and like the other people have all said, we need to give them the direction and the tools so they can move on in their future, wherever, whether it's career or education or wherever you have in life. Um, it's not just about education always, it's about life experiences down the road. Ms. Tucker. I believe that we need to um, work with our students to give them the tools that they need to be successful for life outside of high school. Not everybody's going to go to college. Um, some people are going to go right into the career force and some, some kids just aren't going to be able to do that. And so we need to be able to give all students the ability to be successful. But I also think we all, you know, even in the elementary grades, we need to have kids engaged. We need to have kids active. I think sports and activities are great opportunities to learn how to be uh, team members, how to build some leadership. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do as a school to give these kids opportunities to be well-rounded for their life outside high school. Mr. Bowerman. I would say, in addition to what everyone else has said, it's about opportunity. Um, schools have a responsibility to, to turn out educated young people who are prepared for whatever comes next for them, be that college or career. If you look back, I'm an old history major, and if you look back at the uh, original states, the colonies and then the states, they actually mandated in their constitutions, in Minnesota's as well, that you will provide an education for all citizens. This is something that we as a country have taken seriously and to this day is something that we believe is important that our children get a foundation in learning, uh, that they can then be prepared for whatever opportunity that they choose to pursue. So I believe it's turning out that educated citizenry who are, as Mr. Ludzak said, solid citizens to contribute to our broader society. Well, let's get historical for just a second. What in the past three to five years has the school district done well, and what has it done poorly and should change? And Mr. Ludzak, we'll begin this round with you. Um, in the past three to five years, I think the big issues, obviously, that have come up that we're all aware of are the referendums. 
Um, I think I can point to those and say the first referendum was not done well. It was not presented well. Um, I don't think they vetted the ideas with the public uh, as well as they should have, which I think led to the you know resounding defeat. I think the second referendum, they learned from their experience a little bit and um, did a much better job of taking the input from the community and presenting something that the community would accept. Uh, uh, it's a learning experience, but I think uh, that's something that, with the with the failure of the first referendum, cost Shakopee a lot of time, energy, and and some money. And those are the kind of things we need to avoid going forward. Mr. McKeon, what has the district done well, and what should change from the past three to five years? Well, I would certainly agree with Mr. Ludzak. Right, we we presented a a vision that had been worked on by the 2010 Facilities Task Force, um, and it wasn't the right vision. It, uh, as Mr. Ludzak said, maybe we didn't vet it out, maybe we didn't have a current task force vet it. Um, it was a mistake, it didn't pass. We did stop and we learned, and to our credit, we, we spent a lot of time, we engaged with hundreds of community members for dozens, scores, maybe even hundreds of hours with volunteers who wanted to help make Shakopee a better place. It was fantastic to see that level of, of passion and interest in the quality of education in Shakopee and getting it right, and I believe that's been one of our best successes is that we have gotten it right. Um, now we actually have to make it happen, not just a, a ballot measure, but make it come to life. Um, additionally, what we've done well in the last three to five years, well, let's see, we're winning awards for, uh, for school finance, and our academics are, are dramatically rising every year. Mr. Poss, what has the district done well and what should change given the past three to five years? I think they've done well with making the, with the failed referendum and everything, they had a crunch, we obviously have a crunch where all the schools and making the class sizes work accordingly to make it easier on all the students even though we are smaller, I mean they had to make it work in the smaller class sizes um, and the teachers with you know having more students than what they really should have at those levels. Um, we also, with the facilities and task force, it did bring back people to give them more of a purpose and more like a, the community support, and it showed everyone what really we wanted in Shakopee, not just what the school board thought or some of the, I mean, they did studies, so it's not like they didn't do their research. It's just it wasn't the right time for Shakopee at that level. Ms. Tucker, what has the district done well and what should change given the past three to five years? Sure. Well, we did all day K really quickly. We added on to all the buildings and I think that was a great success to do that in a short window of time. We also have saved the taxpayers a lot of money in refinancing our bonds. We also have, um, this year we have incorporated the Excellence and Equity uh, group that is going to work with our minority population. Uh, the referendum for sure was definitely a failure that first time around, but boy what a learning opportunity we got and we are so excited to move forward this is going to be good, and I think this was actually a blessing in disguise for us. Mr. Bowerman, what's gone well and what should change given the past three to five years? I'll start with the, the obvious challenge that's been mentioned, that is the last referendum uh, that failed. That was clearly a setback for the uh, district, for the community, um, but I think it really uh, provided an opportunity for more engagement by the community, and ultimately what we're doing now, I think we all probably would agree the community is universally behind, or at least very strongly behind, so it's turned that negative opportunity or the negative experience into one where the community has rallied behind what the district is going, and consequently there is unanimity uh, behind that. Uh, some of the things that Angela mentioned were terrific in terms of our ability to take a mandate from the state that provided funding for all day K to get building extensions built as quickly as we did uh, and get that up and running was phenomenal. We have um, maintained a very strong fund balance. Uh, our financial strength of this district, I don't think people appreciate just how strong it actually is. Um, we are providing more opportunities and extracurriculars for kids to be engaged because we know that when kids are involved in extracurriculars, they perform better academically, and our academic results have been improving year after year after year. You look at our MCA3 scores, uh, et cetera. Mr. Canning. Thank you. Um, I think kind of the obvious that's been mentioned about the referendum, I would agree with Mr. Bowerman that something that didn't go as well turned out to be a great positive. And I think part of the reason for that was that in the meetings that we had as a large group of really nearly 100 people, there were no options that were off the table. And I really felt that, and I'm hoping that people felt that they had a voice in how that, uh, how the proposal was finally concluded. Um, when I look at strengths, 
I'm not sure that everyone in the background knows how much effort goes into testing, how much of a stress that is on districts. I think one of the hires that the districts made in hiring Dave Olowski to help teachers and principals dissect data and help teachers understand, okay, uh, these are the skills that we're deficient in, these are the areas that we have to attack. Um, that truly, I think, was very beneficial. I think also there's a perception that we're spending more money and that maybe was looked at as a negative in hiring more administration, but it actually, if you look at the spending, it's very close to what it was now per student to what it was eight years ago. Ms. Lavoie. I think that really what needs to happen going forward as far as changes are concerned is to capitalize on the things that are already happening, but to really focus on some of those things and make sure that that momentum keeps going forward and builds. So the community has been involved in the referendum, the community is being listened to, and the community needs to stay involved and keep being listened to as high school planning is done, as changes are made in funding, or as any changes are considered at the elementary levels. In addition, there are partnerships that are being built with businesses. There's this idea of maybe partnering with St. Francis at the high school campus. There are so many resources out there in the community that if we keep them involved, we can give our students a lot more opportunities by having those people involved. So it's just focusing on those things and continuing forward with them. Candidates, thank you for your responses, and allow me now to introduce to you a student from Shakopee High School, Sam Fountain. He is a part of the Introduction to Democracy class at Shakopee High School, and the students from that class have written questions, and he's coming to ask you first one and then a second question during the debate today. Sam? Thank you. Aside from the expansion of our high school, what is the biggest problem facing our school district at the present time? Mr. Pass will begin this round with you. Biggest problem? Relocating the fields that are going to be re replaced um, with the expansion of the school. Uh, everything needs to have, I mean, there, the gym classes need to have places to go outside, the practice facilities for sports. I know I'm, this is a lot of sports conversation, um, but to make it more, it's, especially with the ninth graders coming to the high school, we're going to have to transport them to the locations so they can get the true fat practice facilities that they can get. Ms. Tucker, biggest problem facing our district? I think the biggest problem that we face as a district is our diversity. We have such a unique uh, diversity pool of uh, our population. Getting them engaged and active in our schools is highly important, and I think if we can get them engaged and active, we'll see that in our test results. Um, I also think that this ex excellence and equity group that's coming or that's here, I think they're going to help. And I really think that we need to have opportunities for all kids and not always focus so much on those high flyers and the, and the low, low flyers. I think we really need to get more of our diverse population, even in the community, actively involved in our schools. Mr. Bowerman. I guess I would say that every time we fail to uh, meet a child's needs, whether that's in the classroom or in extracurricular activities, somehow where they fail to um, reach their highest potential is a failure of the school district. That's not from lack of effort, that's not from lack of trying, but it may simply be because we missed the signal in the classroom. We didn't have a resource that would have made a difference for that child. We didn't have uh, an extracurricular activity that they could get interested in and excited because we know that kids who participate in other activities at school perform better academically. So I don't see this single event that you can, uh, or single item that you can fix and, and flip that switch. It's trying each day, every day, all of us in the classroom, administration, school board, in terms of making sure that we provide the resources necessary so we minimize those chances where that child in that instance doesn't get what they need uh, to learn and to succeed and to achieve to their fullest potential. Mr. Canny. I think a big concern that's been out there is our growth, and I know that you targeted the school addition, that that's going to help remedy some of that, but how do we grow year after year, and how do we address those needs as we become bigger as far as staffing? And I think to echo Mr. Bowerman's point, as we grow, we've got to make sure that we're still recognizing where our kids are. And it, you know, it seems kind of cliche because we always talk about growth, 
but there are some real issues in our schools that are being impact, impacted just because we're growing and, and it's like we're constantly expanding and how do we keep ahead of that curve? So I see that as a real big concern. Ms. Lavoie. I see one of our biggest problems connected to what a lot of people have been saying, which is keeping all the kids involved in school, however that is. They need to feel connected to school. But my take on that is a little bit different in that we need to address even more than we already do because our teachers are doing a great job of already doing this. Kids need to move around, they need to do art, they need to do music. Research shows that when they do those things, they learn better. So if we can incorporate those kinds of things more into their learning and have other opportunities for them to connect to their learning, that is going to spur the whole district forward. Mr. Ludzak. Uh, my son who's in high school would say later start times for the high school is the biggest problem. But um, I'm gonna, it's a one, you asked for one thing, I'm gonna mention two. One, Angela already mentioned. I think um, the minority community getting involved in activities uh, is important. I think there's there that's lacking to some extent, and um, something to school as a school board we need to come up with incentives with ways to improve that. And then uh, going forward, this is maybe not a problem today, but I do think with all the new um, opportunities for jobs that are coming to Shakopee in the next few years, um, that's going to be a stress on the school district to provide services for the students, the children of those employees that are going to move to the area. And that's going to be a challenge going forward over the next several years. Mr. McKeon. Yeah, I, I said it before, but I truly believe that uh, the voters supported expanding the high school with the, with the academy focus. Well, we all had an idea of what that looked like, or we had kind of a, a vague picture. Now we have to make that come to life and really see the impact that other districts that are doing that happen, really see that transformation of, of uh, student learning and engagement through areas of interest, whether that be the arts and, and whatnot or more science-based, uh, based on the student's aptitude and really f figuring out how to have personalized learning, what's best for them and what they're interested in. Well, candidate Sam has one more question on behalf of the democracy class. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is an important aspect in the Shakopee education system. What are your plans for growing and maintaining the current technical education in Shakopee schools? Mr. Bowerman, we'll begin this round with you. The first thing I would say is in a few years, this isn't immediate, but in a few years we're going to roll out the academy's uh, structure in the school. And there are several of the academies that are geared towards STEM-oriented coursework. So that's number one. But that's a few years down the road. Uh, right now, we are starting this year, and I think the community is probably aware of this, the CAPS program. And the CAPS program right now has two partners, uh, one being St. Francis Regional Medical Center and the other being Shutterfly, both geared towards STEM activities. And we expect that to grow and flourish, uh, probably beyond STEM, to be very honest. But those two programs are certainly uh, a focus right now. Um, speaking as a, uh, a person who didn't come from a STEM background, I never want to lose sight of um, a well-rounded student who is exposed to uh, everything that needs to happen in an education. But clearly, the way the economy is going and the kinds of jobs that are predicted to be in the future, the kinds of programming we can offer in STEM from robotics uh, outside of classroom to the uh, um, Project Lead the Way and opportunities for kids to get exposure to engineering, for example, in high school, is phenomenal and we should continue that. Mr. Kenny, how can we grow and maintain the current technical education in the Shakopee schools? Well, it's exciting to be talking about a program, STEM and Project Lead the Way, that's nationally recognized here in Shakopee. Um, I think you continue to listen to the students and what their interests are. You look at how do we uh, plan for additional students within the high school that are interested in STEM. Do we make sure, how do we make sure we have enough space for that? But I would also echo what Reggie said in that it is part of a well-rounded education. I would also look at the academies are going to help address that. But very much the schedule in the high school is driven by student interest. And so if we as staff and educators can keep that excitement, keep partnerships with businesses, we hope that it grows. But it's really, you know, we react to what the student interests are, but we have an obligation to help encourage that. Ms. Lavoie. I completely agree with everything he just said, and I would add to that that to get that student interest, it has to start younger. 
it has to start in the elementary grades and Project Lead the Way is happening at elementary grades. But the teachers need more time and more support to put science and technology into their curriculum at the younger grades so that those kids stay interested and move on to it at the high school level. Mr. Ludzak. Um, I also agree. Uh, working in private business, uh, what I do, I work with all kinds of different companies um, in almost a consultant role, and a lot of them are heavy manufacturing or manufacturing design engineering medical device companies, and they're looking for engineers. STEM is a very important program for getting our students in the position where they can, they can uh, hold those jobs in the future. Um, I think partnering with local businesses is going to be key to making this happen, and we've already started with a couple. Um, we need to expand that, maybe expand it to the surrounding area. I think there's opportunities with technology that's available now, and even more so will be available in the future, to get the best quality of education, uh, maybe using technology from some area of the country for our students here in Shakopee. So I think using technology and partnering with businesses is going to be key to making this happen. Mr. McKeon. Yeah, first of all, let me say I agree with everything so far. Um, great answers. Um, using technology, as Mr. Ludzak just said, we're, part of our referendum was $2.5 million per year for technology to get into the students' hands and to get better technology into the teachers' hands so they know how to teach with technology. So technology will be ubiquitous throughout the schools. Um, one of the things that I want to stress with the academies, even the students who take the arts and communications path still have state standards. There's still requirements for biology and chemistry, so we are still going to focus on technology at, for every student, but some students might gravitate towards, you know what, I want to be an engineer, so I really want to take more advanced, rigorous courses and find out if that's truly what I think it is. So we're offering a depth of skill, but also a baseline of skill for all students. Mr. Poss. I think the electronic devices that are going to be implemented into the system are going to help because it's going to even the level, uh, level the playing field for all the students out there. Some people don't realize or don't have a, a good feeling of what you know, science, technology, engineering, and math really brings because they don't have the access to the, the tools. And I think this will help in, like I said, even the level or level the scoring field. Ms. Tucker. One thing that maybe many people might not realize is this year we started a pilot at the preschool with all day fours, and they started a STEM room that they now have. So our kids in preschool now have an opportunity to get some uh, opportunities with the STEM projects, and I think that's a great opportunity. I think we really need to focus on getting more opportunities for our younger kids. And just as the others had mentioned, this academy approach is really going to give us a great opportunity to give kids different tools and a different perspective. Um, so I think we're on the road. We just have to start and grab these kids a little younger. Now for the next question, we're going to turn first to incumbents and then to challengers. And incumbents will begin with you. What work on the board are you most proud of? What have you done on the board that you're most proud of and why? And we'll begin with Mr. McKeon. Uh, well, it's been talked about a lot, but passing a referendum resoundingly with strong community support. I did a little bit of research on to the, the people who voted in Shakopee in school elections over the last 20 years, and I found out, and I, I passed this along to our Vote Yes committee leaders, uh, there were 1,179 people who voted in their first school election this last May. 1,179. So through the efforts of the Vote Yes committee, through the Guiding Coalition, the Facilities Action Team, to everybody who showed up at an event, um, it was just a resounding success. I think to our credit, we listened. Um, one of the, the groups that I don't think we've credited enough is administration for coming up with the academy's approach because as a board, we were pretty well dead set on valuing small learning communities, not wanting our kids lost in the number of being one out of 3,200 in a building. So the academies really allows for that small learning community and that personalized learning. Um, so I think that that was just a fantastic, innovative way to, to reinvent education in Shakopee. Ms. Tucker, what are you most proud of of your work on the board? There's so many things that we have a board have done, but what we do, we can't do without our teachers and we can't do without our administration. But I have to say the most exciting thing for me is this CAPS Academy, this opportunity to give kids real world work experience while they can maintain getting um, high school credits, college credits. These kids, I've talked to a few of them, they are learning things that they wouldn't even learn in a classroom. They are going to be so set for the future. And for me, that's my 
big, it just happened, but it's my biggest highlight of being on the board. Mr. Bowerman, what are you most proud of from your work on the board? First thing I would say would be the rebound after the uh, previously failed referendum. And, and I don't mean necessarily what we went to. It was the fact that the board and the administration, for that matter, took a step back, said obviously what we put forward was not well received by the community, but we didn't dig in our heels. We didn't uh, pout, if you will. We went back and we said, how can we put a process in place to engage the community and understand more deeply and better what it is that they were interested in and would support? Because it was not an option to do nothing. That was not an option on the table. So consequently, we put a process in place, we engaged hundreds of people, and we ended up with a referendum that passed overwhelmingly. So that process is one of the things I'm very proud of that led to a successful outcome. A second thing I would say, and I alluded to it before, is the improving results uh, in terms of our academics across the board in our district. When you look at our MCA3 scores over the last four years in reading and two years in math, we are outpacing the growth of any other district in the metro. And the third thing I would say is the financial strength of the district, which I think is understated and undervalued given the strength of our general fund balance uh, and the financial strength of the district. Now, Mr. Candy, you are a former member of the school board, and so we look back to your days on the school board before. What was the work that you did on the board when you were on it before that makes you most proud now? I think the positive relationship that we had with teachers and staff in negotiating, uh, very kind of give and take negotiating, not kind of who can best whom. Um, I also look at, we were able to set aside a fund to pay for future obligations that we had negotiated in years past with teachers as far as benefits go. Um, and we also worked very hard to keep class sizes down. Those are, are important things, but probably the biggest thing is the work that we did on how can we really focus on each individual student and what can we do as educators to target specifically where they're deficient and also look at you know, what are we doing well and, and what is it that we're doing to have our kids perform well in that area and really dissecting that. Challengers, we're going to change the question just a little bit for you and describe for our voters how you went about acquiring the information you needed specific to this district's priorities, to the opportunities and successes that, that our, our district has in order to prepare to, to run. So in other words, uh, tell us specifically what homework you've done to prepare to be on the board. And Ms. Lavoie, we'll, we'll begin with you. I have looked into the district's school board meetings. I attended one. I have been following the referendum very closely. There are quite a few people in the neighborhood where I live, and my husband is actually one of them, who weren't real supportive of the referendum idea. So I did a lot of research into where was the district getting its enrollment numbers? Where are they getting these ideas? for cost projections, for adding on and doing other things that they could do in the referendum. So I did a lot of research at that point in time, which was before now. In addition to that, I have looked into different programs that are going on in the district and have asked questions of teachers and different administrators to find out what is the St. Francis project idea that is going on right now and other things like that. Mr. Ludzak, tell us how you did your homework in getting ready to serve on the school board. Um, in a couple of different ways. I have attended some school board meetings, and I've watched some on wonderful public access television. Um, probably more so talking to people in the community, uh, friends that I'm associated with, whether it's through uh, youth activities or church. Um, my wife is an employee of the district. She works at the East Junior High, so I know a lot of the staff members, spend time talking to them, just to get a better idea of what's going on in the district, what their view is, what other people's view is. So it's really come from um, attending some of the meetings and, and looking at some of the formal uh, things that are going on, but really getting a feel for what the community thinks is going on behind that. Mr. Poss, tell us about the homework you've done to prepare for a seat on the school board. My homework's kind of been my lifelong experience in Shakopee. Um, I graduated from here, like I've said. Um, I've always been a follower of all activities, from sports to arts to education. And just recently, two years ago, when the Operations and Facilities Task Force started, I got involved with it more from a different avenue. And then this last summer, now with the outside committee, there's, there's a feeling and a knowledge that I'm just getting, getting used to, and I, I want to keep going. 
Well, the challenge is we're going to stay with you for the next question and ask what experience do you have with complicated budgets like a school board or school district's budget? And Mr. Ludzak, we'll begin with you. Um, I've been involved. I've, I've ran my own business. I've uh, started, sold a business in the past. I've, I still have a... Uh, one company that I still uh, maintain. Um, I'm, I've been a director of sales, working on a budget for a company for a number of years, and vice president of sales with the company before that. So in private world, I have some experience. I've also sat on the board of a nonprofit and been involved in their budget. I've sat on church boards. Um, uh, that was a foundation. I've also sat on church boards and worked on the budget in those areas. Uh, not, none of them approaching what the school budget is, I will say that, uh, including the businesses, but uh, multi-million dollar uh, ventures um, or organizations that I had to be responsible for uh, the funding. Mr. Poss, complicated budgets. I have not had anything to do with big like school budgets like Ken said. Um, I my personal job on inside sales, so I'm dealing with constant bidding on different projects and trying to stay at a different levels. Um, when we know where we need to be, we hit those numbers. I also, with this outside committee that I'm on this summer, we have, we know what we, we're allowed to spend after what the referendum went through. And we, yeah, we want bigger things and more added to it, but reasonably we can't. And we have to pick up what's most important at this time. Ms. Lavoy, complicated budgets. I would not say that I have run a complicated budget of any sort. I have run small grants at Minnesota State University, so I've managed those budgets. I have a very large course that I teach there, and I have to manage that budget. And of course, there's everyday household budgets, learning how to invest, learning how to save for my kids' college, factors like that. I would definitely put time into learning what I would need to know to manage a large budget. Well, incumbents, we want to ask you then, what is the process or what would be a process to determine if a proposed budget is going to be good for the district? Ms. Tucker, we'll begin with you. What's the process for determining if a proposed budget is going to be good for the district? I think we need to take a look at where are we at and what are we going to do? What are the, what are the funds going to be used for? And if they're going to go towards the students, then obviously we need to do what we can to give the schools what they, what they need or the students what they need. But I have to say we have a really great finance group that does a really good job at educating us, preparing materials for us, and giving us insight into what um, all the budget items are. It is a large, a large amount of money um, that we're dealing with, but we've won finance awards. Our budget is good. Mr. McKeon, what's a good process for determining if a budget is good for the district? Um, First of all, listening to our experts, right? As Angela said, we have an outstanding finance team that has now won three years in a row the state award from financial excellence, right? So they know what they're talking about. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people don't really understand or, or know about is we get a lot of money from the state, but much of it comes with pretty specific strings and where it has to be spent and how it has to be used. So we have to rely on our, ex on our experts, our superintendent, assistant superintendent, district office staff, principals, teachers, need to find ways to, to maximize our dollars um, f from things like having a seven period day. There's impacts if we wanted to change that schedule to spending um, on teacher contracts, technology that we put in. Um, the, the bottom line is, does it get in the hands of kids and is it best to help them raise the quality of education? Mr. Bowerman, how, how does the district decide what's a good process? Some of it's uh, basic math. You start with your revenue projections and you understand what it is you have to spend. And as Matt just alluded to, there's funds that comes from the state that's earmarked, uh, Title I dollars, et cetera, things like that. So you don't have an opportunity to spend those in other ways. So you start with the revenue coming in the door. You look at the strategic plan that the district has in place and you identify those areas that you're trying to focus on. And then you try to put plans in place and the resources behind it. Uh, to achieve those objectives. So it's a very complicated process, especially on the revenue side, because as folks probably will remember, it wasn't but a few years ago that the state had a promise of funding the schools, and this is statewide, including Shakopee, to a certain level, and because of budget constraints, they couldn't do it. And so consequently, you had districts that were having to lay people off, take out loans, and pay interest. Shakopee did not have to do that because of the financial strength of the district. So we've done that very well, and we would need to continue that. Mr. Canny, what's the process for determining if a budget is good for the district? Well, I would, I would agree that we need to look at our experts in that area and not micromanage, but we also need to ask good questions. 
and what are we doing to be good stewards of the money that's allocated to us. Um, I would agree that our budget is in good shape, but even with that, what can we do better to make sure that our spending is done well and can benefit students mostly? And one example of that is when I was a principal, we would be given our budget and then that would be allocated out. And I'm a very strong proponent of site-based budgeting because I think it creates good spending, it gives teachers ownership, and I was amazed that coming into a district that didn't have that and then implementing it to see the way that teachers flourish when they have control over their funds and how much better they're spent in doing that. Well, candidates, our time is running out. And if people have uh, additional questions, and I just set aside a very large stack of good questions that I had wanted to ask you all this evening, you are welcome to connect with candidates after this evening's debate or to contact their campaign offices. Uh, you can also find out more about our candidates at the Chamber's website, uh, shakopee.org. Each candidate, you will now have 60 seconds to make your closing statements, and Ms. Lavoie will begin with you. I am a parent of two kids in the district. They're a first grader and a second grader. I am interested in being on the school board and listening to the community and making the district better for my kids and all the other kids that are in the district. I'm interested in doing that for a very long time because my kids are so young. My main thoughts when I make decisions or would make decisions on the school board would be about are we providing diverse learning opportunities for kids so they can connect to school in some way, whatever way that might be, and are we educating all the parts of their brain, not just focused on reading and writing and math, but science and art and music, all the different arts, all of those things are really important for our kids learning. Mr. Canny. Well, thank you for an exciting evening and thank you to the audience here for holding out with us. Um, I am really excited about our future with Shakopee Schools. I'm excited about where we've come and I'm excited about where we are, where we're going and what we can do as leaders. I'm also excited about the people that we have up here in this panel. We have very well qualified people and I think regardless of what you choose, we're going to be in good hands. I also look at the perception of the Shakopee schools and it really saddens me to see that we have a part of the public that feels like the school district is not being transparent. That's not my, tra that's not my opinion and it's not my reality, but I feel like we as a board have an obligation to look at the public and try to find out what is it specifically that's going on that's making people feel like we're not spending funds well and that we're not being transparent. That would be a, a number one goal of mine, along with very excited fashion of looking at the opportunities that we have as far as the referendum, both being the technology and the addition to our high school. Thank Mr. You. Bowerman, I'm sorry, Mr. Kenny. Mr. Bowerman. Thank you again to the Chamber for sponsoring, for River Valley for hosting, for all of you who've shown up tonight and anyone who's watching at home because the fact that you're doing that indicates you're interested in public education, we appreciate that. I also want to extend my thanks and my best wishes to my fellow candidates. The fact that you guys are here tonight indicates you're willing to serve, and not everyone can say that, and I applaud that. We've got a lot of dynamic growth and change going on in Shakopee as a whole, and certainly in the school district, and uh, it's impressive, but it's also challenging. I believe that I offer a nice blend of several years of board leadership and board experience. I've been involved in local education in a variety of ways over a number of years. I've got a solid grasp on the issues that this district faces, not the least of which is the referendum, because I'm intimately involved in that. And I bring nearly 30 years of business, leadership, management, and experience, all of which will help me serve this community, our schools, and our kids. I certainly hope to be one of those that you pick this fall. I ask you for your support, and I ask you for your vote on November 3rd. Thank you. Ms. Tucker. Um, when you think about why should I be elected as a school board member, I have a couple, I think of a couple things. One, I'm completely committed. I have yet to miss a board meeting since I've been on the board in almost four years. I have a high attendance rate in my committee meetings. Um, I've been the board clerk for four years. Um, I also think I'm a diverse person on the board. I have uh, 
two kids, one's a senior and one's a preschooler. Both of them are African American. One has special needs, one is typical. I bring a different perspective than maybe my fellow candidates would bring. I also think that as a board member, we have learned a lot in this last four years with a failed referendum, a past referendum. We've heard from the community. We've gotten a lot of great, valuable information. And I think that we are in a great momentum and we have a lot of great things ahead of us. And I would appreciate your support come November 3rd. Mr. Poss. Thank you. I hope to get your vote because I am unique. I am original Shakopee. I have traditions that some people don't, and I want to bring those towards the future. I don't want to just dwell on the past, or I shouldn't say dwell on the past, live in the past. We can't do that. We have to move forward. And I feel with as passionate I am about Shakopee and just getting started, and I want to see these last two, last summer and then this summer with the committees I've been on, I want to see it follow through on. I want to finish what I started, and I want to also want to bring I want the community to be able to, like I said earlier, trust back. And I feel like with my, me and my family, the way we've, we've been raised, uh, people feel comfortable where they can talk to me if they have any problems in the streets. Mr. McKeon. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to start off by saying that, you know, I have been a, a long time resident. I've been here since 2001, not as long as uh, Mr. Paws here, but I, I have been here. It's, my, it's home for my kids. They've lived their whole life here. I'm fortunate enough to have two kids who are students at SunPath, and I'm dating a, a wonderful woman who has two kids here in the audience who are, uh, one's at Jackson, one's a preschooler. So um, I'm getting a view of different elementary schools and learning more and more. Um, I bring human resources experience. I've been involved uh, for four years now on our negotiations committee with all different groups, teachers, principals, superintendent. Um, one of the other things I'm, I bring to the table is that I'm very active in the community. I'm active in the Lions Club. I'm also on the board of the Shakopee Alumni Association, even though I'm not an alum of, of Shakopee High School. Um, and my main focus is just what it was four years ago when I was first elected is to dramatically increase the quality of education in Shakopee. I would like to be part of the bright future here, and I'm asking for your vote on November 3rd. Mr. Ludzak. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, we have some excellent candidates, as, as Reggie said. Uh, I'm honored to be amongst them. I do think I offer a couple of unique uh, abilities that could be a benefit to the community, and one of those is being an outsider. I haven't been on the school board. I haven't been through the referendum process for the past four years, and I think it might be good to have a perspective of someone who wasn't intimately involved with that process. I also, in private business, my role is to look at organizations, large organizations, and, and uh, help them become a, the, as efficient as they can be. I think that could benefit the school board um, as we look at utilizing taxpayers' dollars. Uh, are we doing things the best way possible? I'm used to asking those hard questions. Um, so because of that, I feel that my background with um, my, my outsider perspective, the fact that I'm uh, experienced in helping large organizations become more efficient, and I do have a passion from my history with ed seeing quality education uh, would make me a strong candidate and ask for your support on November 3rd. Thank you. Well, as we close this evening, allow me to remind you that the views expressed in tonight's debate are those of the candidates, not those of the Chamber and Visitors Bureau. The Chamber is sponsoring tonight's event as a service to the community and has gone to great lengths to ensure the objectivity of this forum. The Chamber does not endorse any candidate but seeks to provide you, the citizens and voters of Shakopee, with the information you need to make an informed choice. We want to say also thank you to our candidates this evening. Thank you to our hosts, River Valley Church. Thank you to Shakopee Kids Voting. And please remember to vote on Tuesday, November 3rd. We'll now take a brief intermission while we prepare for our city council debate. Good evening.
Well, welcome to tonight's candidate forum for the City Council of Shakopee. Uh, just a few reminders before we begin the debate this evening. Again, there are no campaign signs or buttons or clothing or literature in the room this evening. And if you would remember, again, we ask you to remain as quiet as possible while our candidates are speaking. And that's so that everyone has the opportunity to hear. And also, we ask that you hold your applause until the end, and we will give our candidates a round of applause at the end. And that's to give the candidates the maximum amount of time to make their points and to have conversation with one another. Also remember, now's a good time to silence all electronic devices. Uh, be great for those to not go off in the middle of this evening. And also, please don't be taking flash photography. Uh, these debates are being uh, taped this evening. They will be made available online, so you'll have access to them uh, in that way. And again, uh, if there are problems with this, uh, chamber members are around and might ask you to leave the debate. But of course, that's not going to happen this evening. And we're just delighted that you're here for this forum this evening. Uh, because we are already over 7 o'clock, if I could could get candidates to come to the stage and we will begin as soon as possible. Well, good evening and welcome to the 2015 Shakopee City Council Candidates Forum being held at the Shakopee campus of River Valley Church. Tonight's debate is being sponsored by the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau. My name is Rob O'Neill. I'm pastor of Brookwood Community Church and a member of the chamber, and I'll be the moderator of tonight's debate. Our candidates for City Council are City Councilman Matt Lehman, Mr. Jordan Olson, and City Councilman Jay Whiting. Would you please welcome our candidates this evening? <laughs> candidates are arranged in alphabetical this order this evening, and they'll have the opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement. After that time, I will ask candidates questions. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond. In some cases, their opponents are going to be given 30 seconds to make rebuttal comments. And as moderator, I'll have the opportunity to ask follow-up questions, in which case the candidates will have uh, 30 seconds to respond to the follow-up question unless that time is otherwise noted. Each candidate's now gonna have an opportunity to make a one minute opening statement and we'll begin with Councilman Lehman. Testing. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce, River Valley Church for putting us on tonight and I'd also like to help thank Rob for doing this over the past couple years. I'm seeking re-election to the Shakopee City Council because I'd like the citizens of Shakopee to have a voice and I'd also like your voice to be heard. Oftentimes we, we have disagreements on subject matter. That's a, that's a good working part of a free democracy. It should be respectful. The more important critical piece of, of what we do is probably policy procedure and uh, uh, planning. Sometimes we're not doing that uh, to the level I'd like to see us do. Um, if you have any further questions that we don't answer tonight, I would encourage you to check out my website at reelectlayman.com. 
Um, there's contact information there that you can contact me directly and I can answer any additional questions that we don't answer for you tonight. Thank you. Mr. Olson. Greetings, everybody. My name is Jordan Olson. I am seeking election uh, for Shakopee City Council. This is my second time running. I, I really think it's important that everybody gets involved. I'm really happy that it, to see so many people in the audience tonight. Uh, I want to do the right thing for Shakopee and move Shakopee forward together. And that's a, a, a really big obstacle. And I, I think that I'd love to make that hurdle with everybody here. And um, I've been on uh, different boards in the past. I am the former secretary of the GOP for Scott County. I have also been to many meetings, as both Jay and Matt know. Uh, I make it my priority to know who our representatives are. I think it's really important that all of you know who it is that you're voting for. And no matter who you choose to be your leaders this time around, or any time for that matter, it's very important that you know where we, where we are and where we stand. So I'm here on this stage, running for city council, to let you know who I am, and to answer any questions that the moderator and hopefully after Thank the meeting you. any of you might have about Thank Shakopee. You. Mr. Whiting. Thank you, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Jay Whiting, and for the past four years, I've had the honor of serving you on your city council. Uh, I've been living here in Shakopee for over 20 years, uh, where I've raised my family here, along with my wife, Melissa. Uh, we've made Shakopee our home and uh, been very active in the community, and I've served on many boards and commissions, uh, both for the city and for other uh, local organizations. You know, four years ago I ran and I talked to people about uh, economic development and jobs. I talked to them about improving parks and I've talked to them about repairing roads and things like that. And uh, over the past four years we've done all of that and more. So I'm very proud of what we've done these past four years. Uh, I'm the guy that can make the tough decisions and uh, that's why I believe that I'm the best candidate for your city council member. Uh, you can learn more about me at jwhitingforcouncil.com. Um, thank you. Well, candidates, the, our first question this evening is, the current influx of lower paying jobs has created workforce, housing, and transportation issues for our community. How would you lead the city as we address those issues? Mr. Olson, we'll begin with you. Uh, great question. I think that a lot of these jobs coming in are they are more of a low paying quality. Some of them, or actually quite a bit of them, and workforce housing is something that it's important because it's usually, in, to my understanding, a higher density, and, and being a member on SPUC, which I neglected to mention earlier, I apologize, I'm also on SPUC, and being on SPUC, I, I realize that the higher density we have, the bigger the building, uh, the more infrastructure we're gonna, we're gonna need. So, uh, Workforce housing, I think that's going to be something that's going to come up here, and I'd, I'd like to see us put it in the right place with the right easements in between higher, medium, and lower density residential. I think it's really important that we separate some of these uses. And if I'm elected to city council, uh, I will absolutely pay uh, critical attention to that. Easements, I'm a big fan of them. Councilman Whiting, the influx of lower paying jobs has created workforce, housing, and, and transportation issues for our community. How would you lead the city as we address these issues? We do have workforce housing issues coming up, in fact, this week. And uh, what some of people don't understand is workforce housing is different from subsidized housing, although typically they do ask for subsidies when they do them. Workforce housing has higher densities that our actual zoning codes don't even uh, have room for. So uh, this has been a topic throughout the county, and uh, SCALE is actually working on that. That's the Scott County Association for Leadership, which I chaired last year. They're working on uh, a group uh, look at this uh, issue. Uh, Savage has looked at it. It's very important to have components of this, but right now we haven't planned for it in any of our zoning, and that's something that we'll definitely have to take a look at. Councilman Lehman, how would you lead the city through the issues created by workforce housing and transportation issues that we face? Well, let me apologize. I got a cold tonight. <clears throat> First, you, when you have bad economic and financial policies, there's consequences. <clears throat> that's, that's the bottom line. We are giving incentives to big businesses that bring low-paying jobs, and we're seeing the, the, the consequences to that. 
<clears throat> the, the fix is not to reinforce the bad decision. The fix is to actually create well-paying jobs so people that are making not enough money can move up the economic ladder by getting a better paying job and become self-sufficient, buying a home and living the American dream with the white picket fence. So how would I do that? I would, I would do what past councils have done. I would target well-paying jobs for tax incentives, <clears throat> uh, which worked very well in the past. It, it brings new disposable income into your economy and, and helps your local economy. Um, and it doesn't create more uh, taxpayer subsidies for the services needed to, to uh, support the subsidized housing. Candidates, uh, many citizens seem concerned about the level of conflict between city council members. After reviewing findings from an external consultant hired to help improve city council operations and relations, the city, the council developed, agreed upon, and ultimately adopted its now called norms of behavior in March of 2015. The chamber has a desire to work with an effective and collaborative city council, so how would you abide by those norms of behavior if elected? Councilman Whiting will begin with you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I was very concerned when, when this issue came up, and I was one of them that drove uh, the, the consultant to actually come in and help work with our uh, city council. It was an embarrassment to me to, to have some of these issues come out in public and, and to see people, members of the chamber and other businesses and, and residents uh, see how things were actually working on the council. To me, I took it very seriously and uh, uh, you know, the personal attacks and uh, uh, have no place at the city council. We have to come to decisions and at the end of the day, abide by the, the three out of five votes, if that's, if that's the case, and at the end of the day, walk out and be able to talk to each other and uh, have a normal conversation without being upset about a decision. And uh, I think, uh, you know, right away we, we tried to talk about that policy and one of the council members voted against it. Now to me it was simple common sense actions that we should have taken seriously and I have taken them seriously. Councilman Lehman, how would you abide by the norms of behavior if elected? Well, for considering everything that's happened in the last 10, 10 months on city council, um, I've been very polite and respectful to all my peers, um, which is not, not normal for me, but uh, I have been. Uh, let's, <clears throat> as soon as we adopted these policies, which I supported wholeheartedly because you can't function as a dysfunctional body, um, it wasn't long ago here, just, just recently, when we decided, our council decided, that we were going to bring up under other business a pay increase, extension of our, our term lengths, and uh, changing the election cycle. We didn't ask the school board if they wanted to go along with us. We didn't have to ask the voters if they were on board with this. This was, at a, this was at a workshop. It wasn't on the agenda. It was brought up under other business. It was voted and moved forward. The policies normally don't allow this, so these policies, as good as intentions as they were, are not being followed by some, and it's unfortunate. Mr. Olson, how would you l abide by the norms of behavior if elected? Good. I'm glad you asked me this question because if not, I was going to raise my hand and use one of my rebuttals or ask if I could. You know, I'd like to remind everybody here and everyone in Shakopee that you're in fact electing the leaders of your city. I was very disappointed to learn that this even needed to happen. And it, should Shakopee choose myself as a city councilor, I'm going to make it a personal goal of mine for this not to happen. I think that the five of us whoever we might be, should be able to set aside our differences, as Jay said, and get along. But I also, uh, to touch on what Matt said too, I want to make it not only a goal of mine for this not to happen, but I think that we can build bridges with each other. It doesn't matter if we are Republicans or Democrats, that we should be able to build a bridge together to at least, as Jay said, sit down together after a meeting or whenever, and to just be able to get along like people. And I think it's really important that uh, a counselor just and a mayor, wh whoever you might elect, act accordingly. And that is one thing I'd like to promise the city of Shakopee. Well, candidates, I'd like to introduce to you now a student, Sam Fountain, from the uh, Introduction to Democracy class at Shakopee High School. The students of this class have, have developed a set of questions that they would like to ask you. And, and Councilman Lehman, if he could borrow your microphone to ask the question, I would appreciate uh, that. And so Sam, yeah, you're gonna wanna wash your hands later quickly. <laughs> if you could ask the candidates a question, please. How do you plan on keeping old businesses functioning in Shakopee with all of the new commercial expansion going on? 
Councilman Lehman will begin with you for this question. How do you plan to keep the old businesses functioning with all the new commercial expansion? Well, I happen to have my own business in Shakopee. Um, we have a, an equity problem in Shakopee. Very large corporate businesses are getting tax subsidies where the existing long-term businesses are not. So how am I going to keep old businesses in Shakopee? The first thing I think I would do, which is first-hand experience here, uh, not knocking any form of government, but uh, our regulations and our fee structure, uh, we need to make sure that when we make a change to our regulations midstream that we include the businesses, because what happened in my own personal business was an entity of government, wasn't Shakopee, came in, the rules were changed, I didn't know about it, I'm in non-compliance, so now I have to shuffle and get into compliance, and I didn't even know I was, I was following the rules that were laid out. So we need to make sure that we include these businesses uh, when decisions are made so everybody's on the same page. We need to make sure our fee structures that we're charging our businesses are fair and equitable, and we need to somehow explain why we have an equity, equity problem between businesses. Mr. Olson, how do you keep the existing businesses functioning while drawing new businesses to the region? Well, I think that's a pretty simple one. I'd like to keep government as much out of business life as possible. Uh, I, I think a, a consistent tax rate, not one that jumps up and down, is going to be a healthy thing for anyone looking to either start or continue their business here in town. What do I plan to do to keep both old and new businesses functioning? Keep the roadways open. We have a uh, wonderful 169 access. We ju we're just open 101, I believe, and sometime in the future, 41 is also going to be overhauled. I realize that's a little out of the city bounds, but as far as traffic flow goes, that's going to be what is really our bread and butter for the next 40 years, probably. And, and so what do I plan to do to keep business better in a, in a nutshell? I want them to have a, some, a consistent tax rate that they can count on and to keep government the most out of their lives possible. Councilman Whiting, what do we do for existing businesses with the new commercial expansion? Well, you know, four years ago, we, we didn't even have an economic development coordinator here in Shakopee. So we've added that component, and along with the Main Street program that we've uh, invested in, uh, had a lot of things going in a positive direction for Shakopee's downtown and other businesses. Uh, we've improved on the commercial loan program where people can actually get a loan to improve their building. And uh, it's a matching fund where they can help out, so they're investing in that also. And it's also, uh, you know, over years, it can be uh, you know, reduced in cost. Um, along with those commercial loans, we've worked with, uh, right now I'm working with SPUC and talking to them. It's actually very costly to redevelop uh, businesses downtown for some of the fees that are charged and the cost to, to, of doing business in town. Uh, Mr. Olson brought up a great point about transportation and uh, any kind of improvements we can do on transportation is always going to improve businesses both old and new. So thank you. Well, candidates, uh, Sam has a second question for you. And again, Councilman Lehman, if he could borrow your microphone for that. How are you going to be transparent with the public on such an expansive project as the community center? Transparency with the public on the community center, beginning with Mr. Olson. Beginning with me, thank you. Uh, I think the community center is a really big deal. I'm not against uh, expanding the community center, but I, I think that we could do better at being transparent with the public uh, when it comes to the whole referendum versus not referendum thing. I think that the, there is a, a large section of Shakopee that does want to expand the community center, but I think that we can do it a little bit better than what has been done thus far. And what I would do is not oppose the expansion of the community center, but I'd like to take another look uh, at what exactly we're doing and uh, maybe reevaluate that a little bit. I'd like to run a referendum if it's a really high bill, which apparently it's going to be, but I, I think it's really important that we, not, we engage the public in every way possible. Uh, as some of you might know, I, I do blog and I do things online. I'd like to set up something like that. I'd like to have a time period for a Q&A um, session from the public and take all opinions in and go forth from there. Councilman Whiting, uh, how can you be transparent on such an expensive project as the community center? Well, transparency is, has been part of this process all along. We've had several public meetings. We had the, uh, the you know, public hearing on this program. We've talked about this community center for 20 years, 
in many different gyrations and many different plans and, and programs. Uh, many different people have had input on it as far as sports teams and the senior citizens have also even had a little bit of input on this too. Transparency will be uh, in the form of how we, we bid this out for, for building and uh, it'll be piece by piece so we have a better chance of getting better deals on, on uh, the development of this. So uh, this has been transparent all along as far as I, I'm concerned and I think everybody has had their input and it's uh, going to continue to be an argument in this town for many years and uh, it's something we're going to look at. Councilman Lehman, how can you be transparent with such an expensive and large project? Well, we started out with a, a hired, use your tax dollars to hire a professional company to do a scientific survey of our community on what the needs might be and what, the, what they're willing to pay. Uh, then we threw it out the window because it didn't say what some people wanted it to say. So how I can be transparent is pretty clear. I have been transparent. I wrote a, I drafted a letter and a paper for everybody to see um, on specifically on the community center. Um, it's unfortunate because we missed the opportunity to use that item to unite our community around something. I think the school district did it right. They put something out there before their, the voters. The voters said no. They redid it based on uh, feedback from the voters. They put it back out there and it passed. Perfect example of what the city of Shakopee should have done using the information from the survey, scientific survey that we, we got from our citizens that you paid for. Councilman Whiting, 30 seconds to respond. That's my rebuttal, please. Uh, yeah, as far as uh, that conversation and the scientific survey, we hit most of the highest topics on that survey if you take away the ice portion of it. We've t we know we need the ice. The, the hockey teams have been talking about that for years. We have no figure skating program. This is an opportunity that to fill in all of those top pieces in that scientific survey that, that we miss. And I think the only thing off that list was hockey. Well, we're going to stay on the, if, if you care to use your rebuttal, you're welcome to, but we're going to stay on the, the community center for a, a while here. And the, the, there was a referendum in the past to build a community center, and, and that referendum was defeated. So the question now is, was the council's vote a chance to circumvent that earlier referendum? And what do you think about that decision? And Councilman Whiting will begin with you. And I do have two follow-ups. I don't believe that was in any way a form of circumventing that process. The, the first uh, community center referendum had 15% of the population come out to vote on that. And ever since we've taken that community center and we've just used it as our drumbeat and our call to arms and people have fallen on their swords over this discussion. And, and to me, this is something that is so needed in this community that we need to get it done. And, uh, you know, Moving that forward is important on so many different aspects, uh, and I've talked to so many people that are in favor of it, and uh, my big push is we need to get those folks to vote in, in the referendum. And as we know, it's never that high a turnout, but from talking to people out there, I am convinced that this referendum, had it gone to referendum, would have passed. So just as a follow-up, do you support the community center, and why or why not? I absolutely support it. You know, I've talked to people, like I mentioned, I've talked to uh, athletes, I've talked to seniors, I've, uh, you know, talked to everyday people that use the community center. I've talked to realtors. You know, realtors are the ones that are saying, hey, this is going to improve our property values. This is going to spur on that next growth of residential development. This is something that's needed in this community, so I fully support it. And assuming since you've said yes, that the answer to the next one would be no, if reelected, would you stop the process that's in place, if, even if that would uh, delay and cost the city money and why? Well, thanks for answering my question for me, but no, I wouldn't. <laughs> no, you wouldn't, would you? Okay. Councilman Lehman, uh, the, the former referendum was defeated. Was the current city council's vote an opportunity or an, to circumvent the referendum process? And, and what do you think about that decision? I think, I think you'd have to ask the three that supported it. Um, I don't think they're apples to, to apples comparison. The, one of the referendums that I personally worked on with Gretchen Tice, we co-chaired it. Um, I think the dollar amount was 6.8 million, lost by 200 or less votes. Um, this is $50 million, it's not even a comparison. So I don't know if that's a, a fair question of circumventing something that's not comparable. Um, What's the, what's the... Oh, well, my follow-up then would be, do you support the community center? 
And why or why not? You know, the problem that I have is we're supposed to be a representative form of government, and there are, that requires the majority of the people that we serve to weigh in on this. Um, we have three people deciding for $40,000, $50 million over 20 years. Um, to me, this is, this is not acceptable. Um, do, I, do I support the community center? I, you know, if, if it's going to be built, I'm going to do everything in my power to, to make the operations as economical and efficient as possible. Um, I, you know, I, what do you do? I don't know all the details on what it would take to stop would it. Would you, if, if reelected and given the chance, would you stop the process that's in place today, even if it would uh, cost the city money? I haven't researched that enough to, to know what would be involved and if, if it is possible. Um, it, we haven't sold the bonds yet for it, so until that process is, happens, um, there is no community center as of today because the bonds haven't been sold. Um, would, I, would I stop it? You know, if you told me it was going to cost $10 million to stop it, probably not. If you told me it was uh, a million dollars to delay it and put it to a vote, yeah, I'd probably do that. I would like to see where the voters stand on this issue. I can't represent them if I don't know where they stand on it. All right, Mr. Olson, was this an opportunity to circumvent the referendum that had happened earlier, and what do you think about that decision? I think it, yes, I do think absolutely it was an opportunity to circumvent the um, referendum. Uh, I think that it's really, I mean, I'm not on the council, and I'm not sure whether or not Shakopee is going to choose my, me to be on the council, but I will say that I think that it was an opportunity to bypass the voters, and, and if Jay over here says that it would have passed when it went to referendum, I would have supported pushing that to referendum. I'd like to, I am running for city council, but we did just have the school board ref, um, people up here, and that they lost a referendum, rebounded, got the community involved, and passed the referendum. I think that uh, by getting people involved, we could really get anything done. I just think that the, the process needs to be involving all the community. I, I think it was, and to answer your next question, would I stop the process, you know, if, if I'm elected? I wouldn't stop the whole process. What I would do is slow down and take a look at this. If it's going to, uh, I want to know the cost of a referendum to have, to, uh, and whether or not that referendum is actually going to cost, uh, save or cost us money. So maybe if we had a referendum, it might fail, and then we come back with a better plan that's a little bit cheaper that the people can accept. I would go the public route, keep it to referendum, but try to involve the community as much as possible, just like the school. Well, you answered one of my two follow-ups, but the, the other of the two follow-ups is, do you support the proposed community center project? As proposed, uh, I do not, actually, because, well, not only is the referendum deal, but because uh, I think it's the most expensive thing Shakopee's ever embarked upon, and I, th I think that deserves dear consideration, which again goes back to the referendum. I hate to say the word over and over and over again. But uh, one of my biggest deals with the expansion, and the issues I have with the problems that I have with it, is that we already have one sheet of ice. We're going to tear down that sheet of ice, make it into a pool, and then build a whole new building on top of the skate park, which to my knowledge, we don't have any plan to rebuild a skate park. So as okay. it stands, I do not. Well, we're going to use the word referendum again, and I apologize. Uh, but there has been discussion about big projects and referendums, and this is still a follow-up about the community center, but you get 60 seconds for this follow-up. Uh, when should we use a referendum on funding projects, and when should we trust our elected officials to make that decision? Councilman Whiting, since this is still the same question, we'll again begin with you. I think there is a place for referendums, and I think it is when you're going beyond, you know, and building something that's beyond your, your, your greatest needs in your community. And to me, this was the greatest need. And the fact that we own the community center already, and we've let it just run in, a, in, a, in kind of a downward spiral of, of operation. I mean, we've got great community uh, staff, community center staff, but we have to give them the tools to, to make that profitable and, and work towards it. Uh, to me, that's, uh, that's the reason why you would do a, something like this without a referendum is because you've got a failed process and you need to fix it. 
Now, if we wanted to add another uh, fire station or police station or add something that we just wanted, then I think that's the time for the referendum. This is more of a need. Councilman Lehman, when do you use referendums? What is the place of a referendum and what is the place of elected officials making decisions? First, if I just heard that right, we used a referendum on a fire station and we didn't use a referendum on a community center. And Which one is more important to you, a fire station or a community center? So to me, government's role, council's role, and city staff's role is to operate your city. Are we gonna come to you for a referendum on a new fire truck? No. Are we gonna come to you for a lift station so that the sewage can flow? No. Are we gonna come to you for a squad car? No. If it's an item that, that the city needs to operate its basic functions, that's our job, to operate a city. If it's something extracurricular, you, the voters, need to weigh in on it, absolutely. And a fire station, in my opinion, is much more important than a community center. Mr. Olson, what's the place of referendum, and when should city officials make decisions? Well, I have been giving this some thought as of late, obviously, with everything that's happened. And as I understand it, our city budget, or our annual spending levy, is somewhere around $16, $17 million annually. Uh, this is a $32 million project, and after uh, we get back paying, paying back all the, excuse me, um, interest, thank you, Matt, uh, it's going to be closer to $50 million. So I would take into consideration, if, uh, if I was a council member, what percentage of our city budget are we actually spending on one project every year? We have a $16 million budget to work with every year, and we need to do critical things like fix roads, make sure water mains are working, and then any kind of miscellaneous expenditures that might come about. So where I would draw the line is at a capital expenditure that takes a, a hefty percentage of our yearly spending levy. Well, staying somewhat on the topic of construction, do you believe that spending several million dollars on a new city hall is a necessary expense given the increasing trends toward electronic transactions and communications? Why or why not? And Councilman Lehman will begin with you. Let's, uh, let me do a little bit of quick history for you. <clears throat> In the past, councils, <clears throat> we've built a police station, a, a library, in a public works building without a tax increase. Actually, we kept the, kept the tax rate steady at 31 for a period of about eight to nine years. At the same time, we saved up money to build these things. We are currently saving up money to build the city hall, and why do we need that? A city hall is, is not just your overinflated administration that should that's overpaid and doesn't do anything. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Reynolds. But uh, it's, it's for your IT department, it's for your payroll department, it's for your benefits department, it's for uh, your planning department. It, it houses a whole bunch of things in it that are not able to be just electronic. You actually need people to work the electronics to make these things function. So if we, if we could build a city hall without a tax increase, um, we, we're, we're out of space at the one we have. Um, the city can't function efficiently. We'll save money from the efficiency side. To follow up, do you support moving City Hall from downtown? Absolutely, I've supported it since 2002. Mr. Olson, do you believe several million dollars spent on City Hall, given the information technology climate, is, is a good investment of money? Why or why not? Well, given the technology we have, we're all instantly in communication with each other uh, all the time. I don't think it's absolutely imperative that we build a new City Hall right now, but I, I think in the long run it's going to benefit Shakopee. Uh, our city hall is, you know, it's, on one hand, let me just put it this way, on one hand we have our city hall located right downtown. We've got all these programs trying to save downtown, and uh, it's, then the city hall wants to move. I know that that's been in the plans for a long time now. Uh, I, I don't think it's an absolutely necessary thing, but given enough time and tucking away enough money, absolutely, if we move it over to, I believe, Gorman Street is where the plan is now, that it would be adjacent to the police station, the city works city public works building, city engineering building, and I think that will benefit us over time, but I don't think it's something that needs to be done right away, especially given that we're, you know, I'm sure some of us are on Facebook right now. Just to clarify, do you support moving City Hall out of downtown? In the long run, yes. Councilman Whiting, do you believe spending several million dollars on a new City Hall is, is warranted given the information technology climate? 
You, you mentioned it, technology, and that's a big reason why we need to move City Hall is we just don't have the technology in the, in the space we need. We don't have the security. We don't have the space. Uh, we've, this is another issue we've been talking about for probably nearly 20 years, and uh, we have the space for it right there set aside. We have the mo most of the money, I would say, for, for building that project. Uh, to me, it's, uh, when you go to City Hall, if you were trying to entertain a big business like, let's say, a Shutterfly or an Amazon, and you brought them up to our Shakopee City Hall, they'd see a bank. It's an old bank. And uh, um, it, it's not what our city should be showing off as itself. And I'm not looking for any ivory tower here. I'm just looking for an efficient, safe building that moves Shakopee in the right direction. And to clarify, do you support moving City Hall from downtown? You know, on a three to two vote, where I voted with Mr. Lehman and Mr. Lewis, uh, we, uh, we voted to, to move City Hall, yes. Mr. Olson, 30 seconds for rebuttal. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, I would like to clarify that although I would eventually move the City Hall, I think it's important that we do support downtown and find a good use for that building afterwards. I believe it's actually, I believe it was actually Matt's thought that we actually have the chamber move in there after the city hall if it moves because uh, I think that's a great idea because you, you got your chamber of commerce right there downtown. You're making a good use out of that building uh, and you're continuing to support business including small business right downtown. So that's what I would, that's my rebuttal. Ms. Councilman Lehman, 30 seconds. The when we go back to 2002, when we adopted the one campus model on Gorman Street, that's a, that's a testament to long-term planning done by past councils. Um, we, at the time when we built the, the police department building, we actually bought the land next to it for this purpose into the future. Does that mean we're gonna build it next week? Probably not. Is it gonna be something that's gonna be done right away? I don't think so. Um, but back to the downtown issue. If the city hall is the only thing propping up our downtown, we need to take a hard look at what it is that downtown needs because it's not your responsibility to prop up these businesses. We need to find out how we make them successful without city hall being there. City council recently approved moving to even year elections. What impact do you think this decision is going to have on our city's elections? Uh, Mr. Olson, we'll begin with you. Well, uh, I'm actually, not quite sure what impact this will have on our elections. In the past, we've kept it on odd years because, well, you have your presidential and your other big elections on even years, so it kind of seemed to make sense to keep local elections local on odd years. I think on one hand, you'll bring out uh, a lot more voters. On the other hand, I think you're gonna bring out different voters, so you're probably gonna see a different landscape of not only candidates, but people that are actually winning. So I think that it will bring our city in a different direction. I uh, also think that if we move to even your elections, you're also going to have a lot of issues drawn out by the gubernatorial or presidential campaigns. That's one of the reasons I, I, I like the odd years, but I'd also like to point out while I am still talking that whatever, whenever we move the elections to, it's actually, as I understand it, going to be approved by the next council, whoever votes, because they needed to have the paperwork filed by, I think, January or something of this year, before the decision was made, basically. So. I think it's going to affect Shakopee quite a bit. Councilman Whiting, what, do you th what impact do you think the decision to move to, to even your elections is going to have? Well, I think it'll definitely bring out more voter turnout. And uh, to me, anytime you're trying to you know, hone down the voters, you're actually doing voter suppression. And I, my whole push is for getting more people out to vote, more people involved. And my hope is that, you know, during those uh, state and federal elections, that more people are looking at the candidates and they're coming down with their paperwork. It's also cheaper for us to run an election as a city while the, the other elections are going on. Councilman Lehman, what impact do you think that even your elections will have? First, let's talk about pol policy process and procedure. We bypassed the school board, didn't ask them if they wanted to go along with us or not. So we could be moving to the national cycle and the school board will st still be on the odd election cycle. So we talk about collaborative efforts and we just totally bypassed them, didn't even talk to them. Um, bad idea there. Whether the election cycle, what day it's on, I, I, I suspect nationally would get more voters. Um, so I really don't have a concern with that. I'm more concerned with the process we used. 
I hear Mr. Whiting talk about we don't want to suppress the voters. It's ironic. There was two people in the audience the night that they adopted this uh, that wanted to speak, and they were told, no, you can't speak to this item. So we're, that night, the voters were suppressed um, and never did get an opportunity to speak to it. So um, national, odd, doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is that you folks get an opportunity to weigh in on these things. Well, we have time for one more question, and it's going to be, what has the current council done well? Where has the current council failed? And what ideas do you have to recover from the failures that you note? Mr. Olson, we'll begin with you. Okay, so what has the current council done well? I think that uh, our mayor in particular has reached out to people online. Uh, I have also done that. I think that's an excellent idea. I think that, you know, he's very engaging with people, and I, I think people really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to see more of that in the future. Uh, how, where maybe they have the, the not done so well? Uh, well, I think a great example is bringing in a counselor to counsel our counselors. I, like I said before, and will make it my goal to have that not happen. Uh, I'd like to see us get along a little bit better. I know we all have our differences, but both these men with me on stage, I've had many conversation with them, and at the end of the day, I, I think we can get a lot farther by, like I said earlier, building bridges. And I'd, I'd like to see us engage the public a little bit more in new avenues that will actually gain people's interest. And I'd like to improve council relations. Those are, that's a good and a bad. So. Councilman Whiting, what has the current council done where, well? Where has it failed? And what ideas would you have for addressing those failures? Well, we've done a lot of things well. We've paid down debt. We've uh, brought jobs to town and improved the communications with our business community. Uh, we've improved the communications in the city, and we've, Mr. Olson talked a little bit about that and our, our presence on social media and actually won awards through our police station uh, on, on our social media campaigns. Uh, we've uh, in improved your insurance ratings uh, by having uh, better response times with our fire department, with our full-time fire. Uh, your insurance ratings are actually going down, and you're saving money. Um, We've uh, improved parks. You know, we've talked about a dog park for many years, and we've, we got that dog park done. We finally got uh, Quarry Lake Park uh, uh, moving forward. Um, as far as things that we could do better, I think the council dynamics uh, could work better um, as a team um, coming across to our general public as professional and uh, as a team group. I think that's an issue that uh, I would like to work on, along with planning and uh, transportation issues is something that I think we need to work on in the future. Councilman Lehman, what has gone well, what has failed, and what ideas do you have to address those failures? The debt that we bought down was bought down by you in the form of higher taxes. We've done a good job on infrastructure and roads, uh, website, social media, communication type things, uh, top-notch staff training, uh, which is always good. Uh, where do we need to look? I don't know if you could say that they're very well at firing employees or if that would be a bad thing. Let me, I would say that Firing Mark McNeil against three decades of uh, past city administrator, against three decades of past leaders, was probably a bad thing. Uh, firing Michael Leak saying that it was based on the uh, restructuring and he doesn't fit the new job descriptions when the new job descriptions were adopted five months later, probably a moral ethical problem there. Um, and the list goes on and on. You know, we t I told you about the voting that night to change the election cycle and not talking to anybody and denying the citizens the opportunity to vote on, uh, to discuss it. And, uh, you know, the list goes on. So I think one area that definitely needs to be looked into and, and repaired is the process, policy, procedure, and just general courtesy. Well, our, uh, Councilman Whiting of I a can, rebuttal. Uh, rebut that a little bit. You know, we've had to make some tough leadership decisions and making those uh, changes in our staffing has been uh, difficult you know, to, to do. It's something that we needed to do to move forward and, and uh, the, the professional dynamics and the leadership that the, the staff was looking for when, they, when we started looking for a new uh, city administrator, those are the things they asked for. You know, leadership, communication, you know, these are the things that we needed and to change the dynamic and move towards the customer service base you know, group down there in City Hall. So, 
That's why those things need to be done. Well, our time is coming to a close, and, and if your question has not been answered this evening, our candidates are here. They will be after the forum this evening, and you have the opportunity to ask them. You can also uh, get in contact with their campaigns and, and visit their websites and find out more about them. In particular, you can visit the Chamber's website, shakopee.org, and find out more about our candidates. Each candidate is now going to have 60 seconds to make a closing statement, and again, we'll begin with Councilman Lehman. Tonight I'm <coughs> darn cold. Tonight I'm asking for your permission to continue serving as your city council member. I believe I've, I've, I've gathered the experience over multiple mayors, multiple uh, councils. Uh, I've got a track record, uh, consistent track record on fiscal uh, responsibility, citizen focus, um, honesty and transparency. Um, I believe that the experience that I have with uh, looking forward, using proper planning, following policies, procedures, and stuff, um, I think it's critical that we plan. Uh, currently, we don't have a planner. Um, we don't have a finance director. So we're going to have to fill these positions. We're going to have to step back. We're going to have to put plans in place, uh, short-term, five-year, 10-year, 15-year, and try to rebuild some of the things we've lost. Uh, moving our city forward. Um, the moving forward from crisis to crisis is, is called management. Leadership, when you're planning things out long term, is what I call leadership. So uh, that's what I would like to do, and I would encourage you to vote Matt Lehman. Mr. Olson. Again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chamber. And um, this uh, River, is it River Valley Church? Excuse me. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you for putting this on, everybody. Uh, I appreciate you actually taking the time to research your candidates and listen to all of us, not just myself. But I, once again, I'm Jordan Olson for Shakopee. I'm running because I love Shakopee and I want us to move forward in the right and responsible direction. Uh, it, should you choose to vote for me this election, and I will work on, one, getting a water tower on the west end of town, because until we have some sort of infrastructure out there, there's really not going to be any development. It's literally pipe dreams. Two, I'd like to work on relations with councilmen, whether or not Matt and I win or Jay and I win or, you know, we're all going to win in the end. I'd, I'd like to work on that. And I'd like to see us go from five to seven council members. I think that we've gone from, a, in my lifetime, a city of around 10, 12,000 to almost 40,000 people now. I think it's time that our representation grow along with that. So once again, if you choose to Thank vote you. for me, I will do the best job I can. Councilman Thank Whiting. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Chamber and River Valley Church. I'd also like to thank you, Pastor Rob O'Neill, for moderating tonight. I'd also like to thank our, my fellow candidates up here. It's a tough job standing in front of you guys. And I'd like to thank you, the audience. You know, uh, I've been working to try and make Shakopee a better place. And, and many people might not think that way in many different cases and different situations. But we've made the tough decisions to, to improve Shakopee. My goals for my, my next four years or five years in office will be planning. You know, planning our customer service at our city hall and planning our community center's growth. Uh, planning transportation and transit projects, and uh, you know even housing. We're, we talked a little about workforce housing. I think we need to move forward with a process and a plan in place so that we have retail in the right places and multiple dwelling houses is in the other places. You know what is your vision for Shakopee? You know is it is it partisan politics at a city council level? Uh, I don't think so. I think your vision should be improving this city like like the rest of us uh, you know our, all of our goals are so I want to thank you for your time and uh, I'll mention my website jwhitingforcouncil.com and I'm asking you. for your vote November 3rd thank you well as we close this evening allow me to remind you that the views expressed in tonight's debate are those of the candidates not the chamber and visitors bureau the chamber is sponsoring this evening's forum as a service to the community and has gone to great lengths to ensure the objectivity of this forum. The Chamber does not endorse any candidate but seeks to provide you, the voters and citizens of Shakopee, 
with the information you need to make an informed choice. Thank you to those of you in the audience this evening. Again, we thank our host, River Valley Church, and Shakopee Kids Voting. On behalf of the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau, thank you as well to our candidates. We appreciate the service that you provide to our community, even by your simple act of running. Thank you, candidates. Election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Please remember to vote, and we will now take a brief intermission while we prepare for the mayoral debate. Good evening. Uh, we've given you most of these introductions before each one of these forums, and so some of you that have been here for the evening will, will know these by heart. Uh, we do ask that there be no campaign signs, no buttons, no campaign clothing or literature in the room. We also ask that you remain as quiet as possible while the candidates are speaking. This gives everyone the opportunity to hear, and also you can tell these debates are short given the amount of issues that we have to cover, and we want to give as much time to the candidates as possible, so please refrain from all applause, except at the beginning of the debate when we will welcome our candidates, and at the end you'll have a chance to thank them as well. Now's the time to silence all cell phones and any other electronic devices you may have brought with you this evening. And again, uh, I would remind you that there are chamber representatives around in the event that someone does not follow the rules, you could be asked to leave this evening. We will be beginning uh, at as close to 8 o'clock as possible, and uh, we'll be having candidates come to the stage soon. We look forward to a good debate this evening. Welcome. Good evening and welcome to the 2015 Shakopee Mayoral Candidates Forum being held at the Shakopee campus of River Valley Church. Tonight's debate is being sponsored by the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau. My name is Rob O'Neill. I'm the pastor of Brookwood Community Church and a member of the chamber, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's debate. Our candidates for mayor are Mr. Dan Hennan, City Councilman Mike Luce, Mr. Bill Mars, and City Councilwoman Kathy Mokel. Would you welcome our candidates this evening, please?
Tonight, the candidates are arranged in alphabetical order. Candidates will be given one minute to make opening statements, after which I'll ask them questions. Candidates will have 60 seconds to respond, and in some cases, their opponents will be given 30 seconds to make rebuttal comments. As moderator, I'll have an opportunity at times to ask follow-up questions. When I ask a follow-up question, candidates will have 30 seconds to respond unless otherwise noted. Each candidate will now have one minute to make an opening statement, and we will begin with Mr. Hennon. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Hennon, and I'm running for mayor here in Shakopee. And the reason I put my name in to run here is because I feel we can do things a little bit better. I feel that we've ha we have some big issues that we have not included you yourselves in the community to make these choices. I feel that there's been a lack of leadership where they've had to hire a consultant to come in to get people to work together. And I'm sitting here saying, come on, we can do a little better than this. So I decided to put my name in. I want to put together a simple and efficient government for you. Councilman Luce. Hi, my name is Mike Luce. I've been on the council for two years. I've tried to immerse myself in every aspect of the city government. I've done ride-alongs with the police department, the fire department, the sheriff's department. Um, I've gotten the FRA here twice. For those of you who don't know who that is, that's the Federal Railroad Authority. We're trying to get a quiet zone in Shakopee. Uh, the UP has come to the table. That's the railroad involved. Um, at this time, I am going to bow out of this race. I am going to put my uh, backing towards Mr. Mars. I plan on doing everything I can for him and I hope he's our next mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mars. Welcome and good evening. Thanks, Chamber, for hosting this along with the church. My name is Bill Mars, and I'm a candidate for mayor of Shakopee. I have served our community for over 26 years. I believe in community service, just like John F. Kennedy said, Back in the early 60s, it's not what your city can do for you, but what you can do for your city. And I, I have lived that for, during my long-term uh, residence here in Shakopee. I would like to become mayor again to face the challenges that we face over the next many years that I'm sure we'll talk about tonight. Thank you. Ms. Mokul. My name is Kathy Mokal. I'm a wife, a mother, and a sh small business owner here in Shakopee. 16 years ago, my husband and I set down roots here in Shakopee. We've raised our family here, we've built our business here, and we've become part of this community. We joined the Shakopee Chamber. We joined St. Joachim and Ann's Parish. We're members of Shakopee Area Catholic Schools. I now serve as city council member. I also am the Land Use Advisory Committee on the Met Council, and I'm also a board member of Southern Valley Alliance for Battered Women. Thank you. Well, candidates, we're going to begin with uh, an article the Star Tribune re ran recently with the headline, Shakopee mayoral election could change city's course. If you were elected, how would that change the course of the city? Mr. Mars, we'll begin with you. I read that article, I was interviewed for it. Change of course. I believe for the last 15, 20, 30, 40 years that Shakopee has always tried to tech, take steps forward. Many administrations have done each of their part. So I don't think, I, don't, I read that quote and I really didn't think it was gonna be a, a change of course. Maybe a steady of the ship, maybe to move forward. Uh, in a way that is more inclusive. Ms. Mokul, if you were elected, how would it change the course of the city? I believe that over the last two years, we've been doing great things for the community. We have paid down debt, we have built infrastructure, and we have um, done many things to collaborate in our downtown. I think that we're on a good course, in fact. So I look forward to that continued growth of planning in Shakopee. Mr. Hannon, if you were elected, how would that change the course of the city? Change of course. Well, me being elected here to mayor would definitely change the course here in Shakopee. 
There wouldn't be any more large-scale projects without referendums. There wouldn't be big decisions being made without taking the time that should be taken to review these projects. I also want to change the course of these tax concessions. I think, as mayor, I can sell the city of Shakopee without tax concessions. We have a wonderful city, wonderful amenities, and I feel I can do that. So that's, uh, that's what I'm about. Well, those of you who are here for the city council debate know that the community center has been a, a, a major issue, and a referendum to expand the community center uh, earlier was defeated. Was the council vote recently a chance to circumvent the referendum process? And what do you think about that decision? And Ms. Mokul, will begin with you, and I do have follow-ups. We have, in Shakopee, paid down debt, built infrastructure, brought businesses to town, a lot of them without incentives. And we put ourselves in a position where, with paying off this debt, that we could do these tax maintenance bonds for the 20 years. If we went to referendum, it would cost us more money, more interest, and I believe that it still would have passed. Well, Councilwoman Mogul, um, I assume then you do support the, the project, given what you have said so far. Would you stop the process that's in place today for any reason if you were elected mayor? I don't see any reason to stop the project at this point. Mr. Hennon, the referendum years ago failed. Was the current city council's decision an opportunity to circumvent that? And what do you think about that I think, decision? I think so. I think that by not allowing that to be up to the voters in the city to make that decision, that is a circumvention. And I feel that it has gone on past uh, referendums that have been turned down, and I think people have said either we just don't want this or we just don't know enough about it. Well, then, to clarify as a follow-up, do you support the proposed community center project, and why or why not? I do not support this project at this time, and I'd like to take more time for the community to get involved. It's a community center, folks. This is something that we should be coming together as a community to put this project together. And I just don't feel that's happening. And just to clarify, if you were elected mayor, would you help to stop the process that's in place, even if that delay would cost the city money? Why as, or why not? As uh, in the debate for the city council race, Matt Lehman had a good point in saying, well, if it's going to cost $10 million, then probably not. But if it's a million dollars, that might be something to look into. Mr. Mars, a former referendum failed. Was the city council vote an effort to circumvent that old referendum? And what do you think about that decision? I think one of the biggest questions about the community center is the community as a whole, which is all of you. As I've been out campaigning and talking to people and actually listening to people, there's a lot of different opinions. I have heard my opponent, along with the mayor, mentioned all the way since last spring that, that I'm sure that it will pass by a referendum. However, we're not seeing a referendum. I am a supporter of the community center. Are there things I would have done differently? Of course. The reason I'm running is actually to work on the financial aspects and impact that our residents, all of us, including myself, I'm a resident, that we will feel in 2017 and 18 and moving forward. Well, I heard you say that you do support the community center project. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, yes. And then the second follow-up that you, you get on this topic, and then we have a couple people that would like to make additional comments. Uh, would you, if elected mayor, stop the process that's in place, even if it would cost the city money, and why or why not? Well, I'm a follower of the process, and I looked at the uh, city agenda for tomorrow night, uh, going out for specs, and then the timeline out outline said it will go uh, accepting the bids in late December. You're asking me a hypothetical. I'm being prepared to lead this city for the financial aspects of it. Um, to go back, I would do things differently. Would I go back? I don't think so. Mr. Hennon, 30 seconds to rebut. I think that it's our duty to fully understand all the costs that are associated with this community center. 
not just how much does it cost to build it. There's an operating cost. There's a cost after 10 years, there's going to be new items that might need to be added to it. There might be some additional maintenance. That's going to cost money, and it's going to cost the taxpayers money. Councilwoman Mokel, 30 seconds to follow up. To say that we didn't have community involvement in this project is probably misstated. We had a task force with the school board that was voted to, to move forward with the project. We met with all of um, the sports associations, the seniors, the Rotary. We also um, did a scientific study through Leatherman. We had three open houses and we did an online um, rebuttal from anybody who wanted to speak against or for the community center. And it was overwhelmingly for the community center. As was the case with City Council as well, we do want to follow up and ask that, that we have heard a lot of discussion about referendums and big projects. Um, when should we use referendums on funding projects and when should we trust our elected officials to make a decision? Councilwoman Mokul, this is still the same question, so we'll begin with you and you'll have 60 seconds to respond to this. Since we are a representative democracy, it is, is just as important for us to vote on these items as referendum. I think a referendum is when we think about whether it's a want of this community. I think when you have put 20 years into building this project and voting it down and voting it down, but your, your city is still growing, we are lacking those amenities for as we grow to those 40,000 people. And that's when it becomes a need. Mr. Hennon, what is the balance between decision making by elected officials and the referendum process? When do you use which? Well, first of all, referendum on the community center. That's a large scale project, probably one of the largest one shock if he's ever done. And so a referendum absolutely needed. You know, for smaller items, just like Matt Lehman said, police cars, fire trucks. I don't think that there's any debate that our community needs items like that. But on large scale projects, absolutely a referendum is a nice way that the people can vote and have a voice in what really happens here in Shakopee. Mr. Mars, when do we use referendum? And when do we have elected officials make the decision? Well, I think uh, for the community center, the state legislator, legislature uh, told us when we have to use it. If we're going to use the GO bonds for a community center, it stated they have to go for a referendum. If you use a tax abatement bond, which in the past has been used for business development, business parks, industrial parks, and recently has been used for expansions of community center, it's, it's go, it, there's no referendum needed. It's a tough decision, just like Council Member Lehman said earlier, we, we referendum for a, for a fire hall that we need that can lower our response time and actually save our citizens some money on their insurance, but then on a dynamic single largest project in the city of Shakopee, uh, we don't have a referendum and it's decided by a body of five. Well, candidates, allow me to introduce to you now Sam Fountain. He is a, a participant in the Introduction to Democracy class at Shakopee High School, and the members of this class wrote several questions to be asked during this debate, and he's got two questions for you as mayoral candidates this evening. Sam. What, if any, are your plans for the expansion of public transportation in Shakopee? Mr. Hennon, we'll begin with you. Public transportation, I think that we look and see what the need is of the community. I think that we look into, uh, you know, there's different transit stations that we put into the community that, you know, are they running efficiently? Finding ways to work with people to get them to and from work or where they want to go. So. Mr. Mars, what's your Public plan transportation public plays transit? an important role. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, commuter transportation with uh, our park and rides that take uh, our, our residents out of our community. I think with our recent business expansion and the opportunity, we can actually be the place where we can live, play, and work in the community. So maybe we should be looking at transportation within our own community uh, as the next phase of transportation rolls out. Councilwoman Mogul, the place of expansion of public transportation in Shakopee. We are in need of expanding our transportation in Shakopee. We have brought a lot of jobs here and a lot of people that are taking those buses into town. Now we need to work on our circulatory system as we get these people from those stops into jobs, um, Canterbury being one of them. We have Valley Fair, and we also have um, 
uh, Rube and Shutterfly and all of those businesses that we brought to town that we need to get those workers to their jobs. Very good. Sam, I believe you have a second question for them. How do you plan on bringing more upper income occupations to Shakopee? Upper income occupations, Mr. Mars, how could we bring them to Shakopee? How would you plan to bring them to Shakopee? Well, it first starts with our community. I believe Shakopee has a lot going for it. We have things that other communities do not have. We have a downtown. We have a vibrant park and rec division. Uh, we have life cycle housing from all spectrums all the way up. I think we have topography, which is important. We're by the river. Um, those things can draw businesses all by themselves. Uh, just over the last five years, many businesses have come here even without incentives. Uh, some ha obviously have. I think we've incentivized seven companies out of 12 in the last four years. But I think Shakopee can stand alone and be proud of what we have, and I think that's what we have. We have a workforce, a diverse workforce that uh, draws employers here, and uh, hopefully they're on the upper end like Emerson or Datacard. Councilwoman Mokel, how do you plan to draw upper income jobs to Shakopee? Well, I think it's important to understand that we are already um, close to 60,000 is our average income here in Shakopee, whereas the metro area is 40,000. I think it's important to understand that when you have RAR, you have um, Bergen Smith, you have your Polaris. There is a lot of high income jobs already in Shakopee, and it's when you understand those averages and to think about where you want to be when you talk about how high of an income you're looking for. Okay, next question, going back to the topic of, of building again, do you believe that spending several million dollars on a new city hall is a necessary expense given the increasing trends that we see toward electronic transactions and electronic communications? Why or why not? For this question, we'll begin with Councilwoman Mokel. Um, I think it's important that we think about the new city hall differently. Um, I think it, that the current facility that we are in lacks security. Um, we need to keep our basement open at all times because that's where our restrooms are. Uh, we have two doors, one which our um, receptionists cannot see during the day to see if people are coming or going, if there's somebody in the building. So we need to work on that, and that's part of the reason that we've been looking at um, different downtowns. I would like to keep, or different city halls, excuse me. I would like to keep it downtown, but again, we were voted down two to three on that to take another look at some of the property that we own downtown. So as the follow-up on that, you would not support moving City Hall from downtown if you had your choice about it. Would you care to explain that decision or that position? I think it's because when you think about your city government, you always want it to be at the heart of your community. And I believe our downtown is our heart. And to take it out of that context, I think that you're, you're losing something. It's not just about the city hall is supporting the jobs, but it's also bringing the people to the downtown who may be looking at different um, avenues of spending money or eating downtown. Mr. Henyon, do you believe that spending millions of dollars on, on a new city hall is a necessary expense right now? Why or why not? I think that it goes with the long-term planning that we've already um, voted for and that we put through. I think that from what it sounds like, and from being down at City Hall myself, that it does seem to be a little dated. Uh, as much as it does dishearten me a little bit that it's moving out of the direct vicinity of the downtown area. You know, downtown is um, larger scale than just around Turtles and just right there, right when you cross the river bridge. Um, I, I do think that, you know, and it's right next door to the police station and City Works, I think it makes some sense to put a uh, nice structure there and to be able to say hey this is our city uh, for the new businesses that are coming into town and for the current people that live here. So just to clarify because we are following up with each candidate you do support moving City Hall out of the downtown because of the amenities that it would bring to the current uh, core of the city campus. I do, I do, I think that's a good project. Mr. Mars, do you support moving City Hall and spending the money given the uh, new information technologies that we have? Uh, 
uh, support spending money. We've already spent money. I, I was involved on the City Hall Siting Committee uh, that included the police station, the buying of that land, and designing the police station so we can have a campus setting. That was well over 15 years ago. It's called long-term planning. Now we're coming into a building. The old bank building is antiquated, inefficient, ineffective for city government, and it's time to move to a campus setting. I think, actually, that's where opportunity knocks for the downtown for the old building. Wherever, if we move City Hall out, that will be a great opportunity uh, for downtown to redevelop that site. So just to follow up again, uh, you support moving the City Hall out of the current downtown. Yeah, I think it's a win-win. It creates efficiencies for our city in a campus setting. For the citizens or the business people that want to come and need city services all at one place rather than spread out over town, and actually, I think it's a benefit of downtown because then it's a redevelopment opportunity and a new style of business, new customers for lunch, and visitors in downtown. And I think that's a win-win for Shakopee. Well, candidates, uh, many citizens have seemed concerned recently about the level of conflict that's been happening between city council members. And again, after reviewing findings from an external consultant who was hired to help improve those city council operations and relations, the city council developed, agreed upon, and ultimately adopted a norms of behaviors document in March of 2015. Well, the Chamber has a desire to work with an effective and collaborative City Council. So what do you think about these norms, and what would you do to abide by them? Mr. Hennon will begin with you. Uh, from what it seems like, there's been a lack of transparency. And from the people that I've talked to, from watching some of the City Council meetings, it just seems that when you have a three to two vote split, it seems like there's three people that are working together and leaving two people out. That's not a good way to manage a city council. And I think that we can do a better job. I don't need to have rules to be professional. I think it's just being professional and being a leader. And I, I feel I have those. Mr. Mars, what would you do to live by the norms of behaviors? Well, I think the last action last spring of the council hall, bringing in a moderator, mediator for a I'm sorry, it's a black eye to our community. We all need to get along. And we need to listen to each other. Stop talking and listen. There's a movie called Dave. It's about the president, Kevin Klein. And there's a moment in that movie where he says, you know, I should listen to you more, you the people. I should care more about you than I care about myself. As a governing board, it's important to work collaboratively together. And maybe it's the common goals that weren't existent and the, the, when the city council had friction. Ms. Mogul, what do you think about these norms and uh, what would you do to abide by them? I think any business has norms of behavior. I don't think that a council is any unusual. Um, you go to a job, you sign a handbook, you are expected to do certain things. I think that you can't open a business and not have some norms of behavior for your staff to know what the rules are. And that's just important. Um, you know, we are a five-member council, and we're passionate about what we feel. But I think at the end of the day, when you start taking personal attacks at each other, I think that is where you need to have the norms of behavior. You need to be able to walk away, whether it's a 3-2 vote or whether it's a 5-0 -oh vote, and know that, you, that your fellow council members have done the right decision for the city. Well... Councilwoman Mokul has recently been endorsed, or not recently, but has been endorsed by current Mayor Brad Tabke. Uh, so we want to ask council member or candidates, what do you think about that kind of relationship? And I will ask a follow-up, who has endorsed each of you um, for mayor? Uh, Mr. Mars, will begin with you. Well, number one, I think the most biggest endorsement that I have right now is actually my wife, because she knows the sacrifices that I've made through the community over the last 26 years of missed dinners, going to meetings, taking part, being collaborative, and working for the betterment of the city. Uh, when I was mayor, the last time when I was running, I was endorsed by a former mayor. Um, certainly, the current mayor can endorse one of the uh, council member Moko. Uh, that's, a, that's an opportunity. Uh, I, we're not... We're not going against Brad Tapke, our mayor. 
we're going against the three of us here to see who's the next person that will lead our city to greatness. Councilwoman, Mo uh, Mr. Mars, just as a follow-up though, uh, have you been endorsed uh, for mayor this time? What, what endorsements do you bring this evening? No, I don't, I don't go out to earn, earn endorsements. I am my own person, I have no agenda, and I'm not tied to any group. I'm just like you. A resident, a neighbor, someone that goes to the grocery store, buys gas, goes to the hardware store, and works at the betterment of our city, and that's what I've always stood for, and I believe deeply in it. Councilwoman Mogul, what does the endorsement of Mayor Tabke mean to you, and how close is your affiliation with him, and what does that relationship mean to policies that you would pursue in the future? I think it was very kind to, for Mr. Tabke to endorse me. Um, I, I wasn't looking for an endorsement. I was just looking to keep going what we were doing in this community, and, I, and that's why I felt the need to run. I think that, like Mr. Mars, I mean, my biggest endorsement is my husband, but I also have three children, 20, 16, and 8, that are looking at the things that I'm doing for this community, and I hope that I'm showing them the type of leader that I would like them to be in society. Just as a follow-up, and we'll ask each candidate, are there other endorsements that you have this evening? No, I wasn't seeking any other endorsements. Mr. Hennon, what do you think about the endorsement by the mayor of Ms. Mokel? Well, I think certainly we can all see that that was going to happen uh, because uh, they voted similar in a lot of things that they voted through, like the community center. So that's not surprising to me. Um, myself, I have not taken any endorsement from anyone because my endorsement is the people here in Shakopee getting out and talking to the residents here, getting out and understanding what your needs are. I don't have a personal agenda. My personal agenda is working for you. And candidates, just to clarify, I have plenty of endorsements to not run for mayor, city council, or school board. So I join you in, in that, and I'm proud of that fact as well. Now, despite the fact that this is a nonpartisan position, how might your personal partisan political views influence how you serve Shakopee? Councilwoman Mokel will begin with you. How might your personal partisan views influence how you serve Shakopee? You know, I, I think that my personal views of being a conservative have, have played well for me. I think that um, as I move forward, I, I as a city council member, I don't think that you get into a lot of those issues. I think it's just as we get into the planning of this city and as we move towards the West End, it is, is the smart planning, and that's what I'm looking forward to doing as mayor. Mr. Hennon, how might your personal political views influence the way that you serve the city, despite the fact that this is a nonpartisan position? Sure. Well, I myself am a conservative. I work in the commercial banking. I, I like accounting. I'm a numbers guy. And so there's conservative thought process in that, conservative even in my lifestyle, uh, living below my means, balancing my own budgets in my life. So I think that that's something that I can bring to the table here in, in the leadership in reviewing uh, the projects and different things that come across the board. Mr. Mars, despite the fact that this is a nonpartisan, non-politically partisan position, how would your personal political views potentially influence the way you serve? Well, the best part about local politics is actually having it be apolitical to represent you, the people. Um, if you want to know what conservatism looks like or feels like, you have someone that was your mayor 15 years ago, and after I lost, you take a 500 campaign signs and you throw them in the garbage. I was talking about my wife earlier. No, no, no. We're going to put them up in the attic. We may use them again. So you take them down from your attic and dust them off and use them again. That's called conservatism. I am a fiscally conservative person. I try to get away from the, the uh, spend and tax policies of the current uh, administration and move Shakopee forward in a continued conservative way that we're most accustomed to in the past. All right. The city council recently approved changing the mayor position to a four-year term. What do you think about this decision? And Mr. Hennon, will begin with you. Sure. I, I think what that did is it just took the power away from the people a little bit. By having someone there for four years, as I understand that when a person gets in the role and they're adjusting to it and it may take some time, uh, it does 
having to elect someone in two years vice four keeps the power to the people to have their uh, representation in their vote. As a follow-up to that, do you believe that the mayoral position, because pay was a part of that discussion, is the mayor overpaid, underpaid, or about right, and why do you think so? You know, I think, I think that the mayor position, I'm seeking it not for the pay. I'm seeking it because I want to serve my community and I want to provide some good leadership. So as far as the numbers, I'm not for raising the pay or anything like that. I think it's probably well validated to have some sort of compensation a little bit, but at the same time, we're shocked to be here. We're not like a downtown, we're not a community of 60,000 people. It's not a full-time job role. It's a part-time job role. There are wonderful people that work for the city that manage the day-to-day -day dealings, and I just think that the pay is good where it's at. Mr. Mars, what do you think about the decision to move toward a four-year term for the mayor? I actually think it's a good idea. It gives a, a mayor, just like a, the council, a little more time. You, you got to learn your ropes over the first year or two to get on board, whether it's council or mayor. So four years, making it equal. If there's five equal board members, with one being the mayor, a weak mayor system, having four, four years uh, on an equal platform is fine. And do you believe that the mayor is overpaid, underpaid, or just about right? Well, I was at the meeting that they were going to discuss a raise from the current 15000 to 35000 And I actually was the one that spoke up. And I'm glad the discussion changed because I got some friends in Dorset, Minnesota that would love to come down. I think they, they, they're brothers, they're four and five and six years old. They'd like to be mayor at 35,000. Uh, there's no room in our community, our conservative community, for a mayor at 35,000 for a part-time job. Councilwoman Mokel, what do you think about the decision to move to a four-year mayoral term? I think it's important to move our mayor to a four-year term. I mean, when you're voting for a two-year term mayor, you are barely getting through one tax cycle because you're or the, your first year you're fulfilling the tax cycle that the former council had put together and former mayor. And so I think it's a good thing to move to a four-year mayor, four -year mayor cycle. And just as I asked the other candidates, is the mayor position overpaid, underpaid, or just about right? I think the mayor pay is just about right. I, I think that as we move forward and become more of a metropolitan community, you know, we, you, Mr. Hennon said 60,000. Well, we're, we're going to be there in, in no time flat. And we have to really think about this mayor and, and um, that it, it is becoming more than a part-time position. I mean, you're on call 24-7, just like an on-call on firefighter. You know, people expect that answer if they're t asking you on a Sunday night. Mr. Hennon, you wanted to follow up. Yeah, I want to just clarify with uh, the full-time, part-time role. I, f I feel that I don't need to micromanage the city. As the mayor, I feel that I can provide the leadership to be there for hard decisions, to be there to support the community and what we need. But I don't feel in raising the pay or treating it as a full-time job role is really necessary at this point in Shakopee. Mr. Mars, a follow-up as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, one of my opponents, uh, Council Mayor Moko, was in a Star and Tribune article back many months ago talking about, oh my gosh, it runs 24-7. Um, you know, I do it for the love of my community because I want to. I don't do it for the pay, and it should be a part-time job. And, uh, you know, if you do it for the love of the community, that's great. But 24-7, uh, you know, I, I, let, we can do better than that. Councilwoman Moko. I think it's important to also think that if we're getting attract people to this to this service that we we do sometimes need to pay more and that's the it to get good people you need to be able to willing to pay more i don't think it's just about the the service aspect that's great but for somebody to take that much time off work to attend ribbon cuttings and and go to business deals with the businesses that want to meet with them i think that they they need to be compensated for that well, candidates, some people on Facebook are calling for the city council to consider restructuring to include representation from wards. What do you think about the idea of representation from wards on city council? Mr. Mars, we'll begin with you. I'm opposed to wards. I've watched many larger cities. It becomes a personal interest, neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, I want this. I'll help you. 
I think the biggest thing in our community is trying to make decisions for the best interest of the community as a whole. I've been doing that for 25 years here in our community and I hope to continue to do it for the best interest of our community as a whole, not section by section. Councilwoman Mokel, what do you think about the idea of including representation from wards? I don't think that I would support wards. I think that when I look at communities that have a ward system, they're also, some of them are even begging people to run in their, in their ward. And I know of one um, person who, who ran and said she'd be absent for a year and they still elected her because they needed somebody in that ward. So I don't think that wards are the answer to what we wanna do. We are a representative government of our entire community. Mr. Hennon, what do you think about the idea of wards? I, I feel the same way. I don't feel that wards would be a good idea for the city of Shakopee. Okay, candidates, the Star Tribune also recently uh, indicated that in this campaign, allegations had been raised against Councilwoman Mokel about business and personal finances. Councilwoman, we'll begin with you. How do you want to clarify or respond to allegations that have been uh, insinuated against you uh, about your business and personal finances? Well, first of all, I think everybody you know, knows about my finances at this point, so um, I don't know what else you want me to tell you more. I think that we've all, as, as community and residents, have gone through tough times, especially when 2008 we had a recession. And all I can say is that I continue to rebuild my life with my husband and my family, and, and I have done a great job the last two years on the city council. We have paid off debt. We have... Um, done more for our infrastructure, and we've done great things for this community. Mr. Hennon, what would you add about uh, allegations that have been made? Well, to be quite honest, I kind of think it was in poor taste to bring those things up. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Kathy Mokal and even Bill Mars here, and I think putting in personal things in a campaign, I think the bottom line is sticking to the issues. Sticking to what's going on in Shakopee, I think that's more important than having conversations on personal issues. Mr. Mars, what would you add? Ms. Kathy Mokal, I am so sorry to hear about your life issues. I hope these pass you quickly. I am an above board person. I always take the high road. I believe I have been in public office before. My life is an open book. And it's true, I broke Mrs. Johnson's window in eighth grade with an apple, and I'm sorry. But I believe when you're in politics, unfortunately, from time to time, it's an open book. And, but with that being said, like Bernie Sanders said the other night, let's move forward. I'm not sure that's exactly how he put it, but point taken. <laughs> Wikipedia says the following about the weak mayor system. In a weak mayor system, the mayor has no formal authority outside of the council. The mayor cannot appoint or remove officials and lacks veto power over council votes. As such, the mayor's influence is solely based on personality in order to accomplish desired goals. So in, in a weak mayor system such as Shakopee has, tell us why your personality would be the best and the most successful at accomplishing your desired goals. Mr. Hennon, we'll begin with you. Okay, well, I'm young, I'm energetic, I'm in the know. I know when companies are moving to different cities. Um, I think that getting the community involved and getting out there, uh, the mayor can have a lot of power and a lot of pull. Even though I am one single vote on a vote of five people, um, I can have a lot of supporters behind me, and hopefully a lot of supporters behind the city council in the dealings that we're working with. So that's what I can bring. Mr. Mars, why would your personality be best at accomplishing your desired goals in the mayoral system we have? Well, I'm a constant positive person. I lift people up. I think that's important as a face of a community. We are all equals. It is a weak mayor, but if you're going to be the, the figurehead, uh, you have to have a, a real positive outlook. You got to know your facts about your city. You got to be encouraging. Uh, I think those are important uh, aspects to have. I think I've had that, uh, have those aspects for our community, and I've had them for a long time. Councilwoman be strong. How, how would your personality be the most successful at accomplishing your desired goals? Well, I think it's always hard to talk about yourself and your positive attributes, but I think integrity is, is one of the bigger things about this community and a love for it. 
And I think that no matter what we do in, in the city of Shakopee, as long as you are the mayor, you have to have a love for your city and to bringing business and meeting with the people that want to meet with you and having an open dialogue at all times. Mr. Hennon, 30 seconds to follow up. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. I, even though you're not seeing it tonight, because you know this is kind of a little serious and everything, right? But I like to smile a lot. I like to, even though I'm not the mayor right now, I get out and I promote Shakopee. I've been bo I'm born and raised here in the community. And I think that there's so many wonderful things that our community has to offer that just talking to people outside of the city, they might not know of some of these businesses or some of these different venues that we offer. So I just think a smile goes a long way. Candidates, the current influx of lower paying jobs has created workforce, housing, and transportation issues for our community. How would you lead our community as we address these issues? Mr. Mars, we'll begin with you. Well, we use a word that uh, doesn't sound very good. It's called workforce housing. I don't know. I was on the Met Council committees <laughs> years ago. They call it life cycle housing. We all have to start somewhere. But it's a whole idea that if you work in a job, I worked at McDonald's back when I was in high school and college, low paying job, lived with my parents, probably could have gotten an apartment with a friend. We all have to start somewhere, but the whole idea is that you're going to better your life and move up, and that's why the word life cycle. So I'm not a big fan of work, work for housing. If we if we had to have it or if we could, we haven't planned enough for this. It needs to be right next to a transit node. It needs to be right next to the services that, uh, though, that workforce housing would demand. Councilwoman Mokel, how would you lead the city as we address the issues of workforce housing and transportation? Well, I think it's important to understand what workforce housing is and what it isn't. It's not Section 8 housing. It is tax credits that are given from the federal government to builders that want to build apartment buildings. And so they do it at a reduced rent. But you still have to qualify um, with income. Um, people that would qualify are even police officers, nurses, teachers. All of those individuals would qualify based on income. And there's an extensive background check as well. And as far as the transit, I, I think that we've, we've done a great job of, of putting in some transit hubs. Now we need to think about the transit to the businesses, the circulator routes, and thinking about how we're going to get them from the hubs to their jobs. Mr. Hennon, how would you lead our city as we address issues of workforce housing and public transit? Well, as we look into workforce housing, I definitely want to uh, learn more about it in the community here to see if people here are for or against uh, certain projects that may come about. We certainly don't want to um, have developers come in and uh, do a project and then leave, and now we're stuck with this workforce housing and issues and stuff that can come from that. Uh, but I do believe that it is good to have a balance in a city that has all different types of housing for everyone. So I, I do believe in it. I just want to make sure we go about it the right way. For next question, we're going to turn to Shakopee Public Utilities. Oh, Ms. Mogul, follow up. Um, I think it's also important to understand that developers don't just build workforce housing and leave. They have to um, market themselves with individuals that will manage the business in a certain way and know what those, those um, government, how to get those government subsidies. They've got to maintain a certain level. All right. Uh, Mr. Mars. Uh, follow up on this. There's going to be a discussion tomorrow night at City Hall about workforce housing in a location that they'd like to rezone. Um, I, I've been a long-term planner in this community for a long time to guide and tell residents that this property is going to be zoned this way for so long and then to possibly change it in a look what appears to be a spot zoning for workforce housing, I would be opposed to that. Well, candidates, should the Shakopee Public Utilities uh, and audience, if you could refrain from clapping so that we can uh, give the candidates a chance to speak. Should the Shakopee Public Utilities Commission consciously try to promote economic development? And this is kind of a three-part question, beginning with should Shakopee Public Utilities promote economic development? If so, what's the best way to go about it? And then a third part, if elected to city office, how would you work with the Shakopee Public Utilities to encourage this course of action. Councilwoman Mokel will begin with you. 
Could you repeat the first part first? Should the Shakopee Public Utilities yeah. consciously try to promote economic development? I believe that the Shakopee Public Utilities should really put um, forth effort as we develop these opportunities in this community. Um, right now, we're not thinking about the businesses that are coming to town and what they want to spend. And we, one of our biggest complaints is restaurants. And uh, O'Brien Public House was one that ended up paying $100,000 just to connect to water that was already there. And they had to do those payments before they could even start construction. So I think that we need to get our public utilities on board to understand what it costs these businesses to do business in Shakopee if we want them to come here. Well, and as follow-ups in that, uh, what would be the best way for them to go about it, and what could you do if you were elected to office to encourage them to do this? I think that they need to rethink about tax credits for uh, the businesses coming here. And then the other piece is maybe giving them a five-year um, payment plan as they uh, build their business and instead of collecting everything all up front. Mr. Hennon, should the Shakopee Public Utilities consciously try to promote economic development? And if so, what would be the best way for them to do that? And how would you go about working with them if you were elected? Sure. I, I think that it does make a lot of sense for the Shakopee Public Utilities to uh, support uh, new businesses and new entities that are coming into the city. Um, I think that there is uh, some way to work with them because there are a lot of initial expenses when coming and doing a project and finding ways to distribute all those expenses over time or finding a way to work out with the business. Uh, Mr. Mars, should, what, so just to clarify, what, what course would you take if elected to encourage them I'd to I'd like do to so? work with the, sh with the public utilities uh, to see what course of actions they're taking, how we can have a partnership with the city council and the Shockley Public Utilities to make sure these uh, items are happening. Mr. Mars, should Shakopee Public Utilities consciously encourage, uh, promote economic development? Well, we do. The public power that we provide and the water that we provide at the utility is actually one of our biggest assets. They are, we have very, very competitive rates on our power and our water, and that's why cities or businesses want to come to our community. When they redevelop in, a, in our downtown and the those fees are expensive. A lot of those fees are d d designed and actually feed by the Met Council. We have a system in our utility that is designed that it will, to build it out to a full scale city when it's all done. And I think those fees are important to build the next step of that. I believe we do market. Uh, we have a three year payback, pl payback program on some of our fees, we only have one customer that has taken up on that and another one declined. Do we market it? It's one tool, and the city should is looking into that. So just to clarify, your answer would be we do that, and what would you need to do if elected mayor to continue encouraging that? There's a great process already uh, in that is moving forward, a collaborative effort between the utility and the city. It's not complete but we're looking at other cities, developed cities that are having the same redevelopment problems and issues with the, the utilities and looking at how we can do that. And our, the, the policy is not uh, built, finished being built out yet, but I think that uh, the city, working in a collaborative effort with Buck, will be uh, pleased with adding a stronger tool in the city's tool chest to encourage businesses. Councilwoman Mokel, 30 seconds to follow up. Well, I think that, yes, we might have low rates, but it's on the backs of the new businesses that come here. We need to really think about what we're charging these businesses as they come and want to be connected to our water service. I think the other thing is um, that Mr. Mars pointed out is, is that uh, we haven't done a good job of being transparent with what we are paying at the utility. As a city, we don't know what that payment is going to be every year, and nobody can give us that number. So I think there needs to be some more clarification and transparency within that organization. You, As a public utility, we can't even find that information online. Mr. Mars, 30 seconds to respond. Are you talking about the fees or the money that we give to the city for uh, cash in lieu of taxes to keep the taxes down? It's tax in lieu, or cash in lieu of taxes as well as finding a budget. Well, I believe that the almost over $2 million that the Shakopee Public Utilities uh, gives to the uh, city each and every year, I think is varied less than $150,000. 
uh, over the last five or six years. It's a very constant number. And as we grow as a utility, uh, the, the payment grows as well. Councilwoman Mokul, I'm sorry you've used your four responses for the evening. But candidates, we do come to our last question for the evening. And for this question, it'll begin with Mr. Hennan. Candidates, where would be the best place for people to find out more about your views on the issues that our community faces? Where, where can people learn more about you? Is there a campaign website, Facebook pages, Twitter feeds? How are you communicating with your potential voters? Mr. Hennan. Well, I, I do have a Facebook page. And if you want to talk to me, feel free to give me a call on my mobile phone. Uh, feel free to drop by where I live. I live right in the heart of Shakopee. And I'm willing to sit down and have a conversation with anyone. So. Mr. Mars, where are the best places for people to find out more about your views and about your campaign? I have a Facebook page. I have a website. I have a phone number. I'm a resident just like you. Give me a call, knock on my door. I'm always available to talk. If someone says I'm not, they're not talking to the right person. So I'm always, I'm a, the most open person available. Councilwoman Mogul, where would it be the best place for people to find out more about your campaign? Well, my website is kathymogul.com. My um, email is info at kathymogul.com. My Twitter follow, um, handle is at kathymogul. And I have a Facebook page, which is Kathy Mogul for Mayor. Thank you, candidates. Well, this evening it is time for us to move into the closing statements portion of our time together, and each candidate is going to have one minute to make closing comments. Mr. Hennan will begin with you. I'm the best choice here for mayor in Shakopee. I care. I care about the people that live in the city. I've been born and raised here. I feel a strong connection to people, and I have a huge heart and I want to care and I want to move things forward, but in a good professional way. And I feel that we can come together as a community and take advantage of certain uh, community items, community center, all you know, these different big ticket things that we shouldn't be butting our heads on, but we should be coming together as a community. And I feel that my background and experience working in finance, I'm able to look at numbers and sort out things. So I'm asking for your vote. Mr. Mars, 60 seconds to make a closing statement. Thank you. I am the best candidate. If you close your eyes and ask what you want in a leader, I have experience as a leader on many boards and commissions here in town. I have the financial background to help guide us over our uh, next several years of some uh, very large expenses. I am educated in business and finance. I'm experienced in government. I'm committed to family and community. If I was elected, I'm gonna put the we back in community, and I'm gonna put the team back into the city hall that we have missed greatly over the last nine months. Last November, I spoke to the city council and I actually said I was too mad to talk over an issue of firing of a city administrator. I said I was gonna do something about it and I'm doing something about it. I care about our community. And I think that we need to come together as a community, and that's exactly what I would do. I'm a name you know, an experienced leader you can trust. Bill Mars, November 3rd. Thank you. Councilwoman Mokel. First of all, I, first of all, I want to thank the Chamber and River Valley Church for hosting us tonight. And my name is Kathy Mokel. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, and I'm a business owner. I have served this community well in the last 16 years as I put roots down here and raised my family. And owning a business, I have a lot of experience of working with others, and I have um, more than enough qualifications to be your next mayor. Thank you. As our time comes to a close this evening, allow me to remind you that the views expressed in tonight's debate are those of the candidates and not of the Chamber and Visitors Bureau. The Chamber is sponsoring this event this evening as a service to our community and has gone to great lengths to ensure the objectivity of this forum. The Chamber does not endorse any candidate but seeks to provide you, the citizens and voters of Shakopee, with the information you need to make an informed choice. Thank you to you as members of the audience this evening for your presence and attention. Thank you to our hosts, River Valley Church and to Shakopee Kids Voting. 
On behalf of the Shakopee Chamber and Visitors Bureau, I want to say thank you as well to you as candidates. We appreciate your time, we appreciate your candor, and we appreciate the service that you are doing to our community by the simple act of running for office. Election Day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Please remember to vote, and good evening.